on lesbian students in the wedding public schools during the 2018-2019 school year for the following reason, general district enrollment. Second, uh, second, second. Uh, Dr. Daugherty, do you have any? Yes. Um, so just to give you some context, this is a vote that annually the school committee takes by law. In order to not participate in the school choice program, you have to opt out of it each year by school committee vote by June 1st of each year. So what you're doing tonight is to vote to opt out. My recommendation would be to vote out, vote to opt out of school choice. Essentially the reason is, is for space and class size reasons, we just do not have any additional capacity for additional students from other school districts. Um, just so you are aware, um, as part of the school choice program, if there are students coming in, uh, there would be an additional reimbursement of $5,000 per student in the Chapter 70 funds. Um, we w could, we could um, delineate a specific grade level or specific level um, if we wanted to, but there is just not any grade or grade level or building right now that we would be able to take additional students. Yeah, I think is uh, you know historically we it's not an aversion to the concept. It's just we just flat out don't have the, the space. Correct. For <clears throat> So just to, um, the, the motion is on the table, it was seconded. A favorable vote on this um, withdraws our obligation to enroll right. students. Correct. Ready for the vote, all those in favor? All those are on 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now uh, we'll have uh, public input for anything that's not on the agenda. Yes, Ms. Sampi. Um, I'm Michelle Sampi. I think I know everybody in the room. Um, so this is really um, a kind of a different place to be now, post-override, which is really exciting. Um, I was um, reading through your policy today, and I understand that any anonymous communication cannot be considered by the school committee. So um, I thought I should probably come down and talk to you face to face. So as you, the school committee, begins the evaluation process of Dr. Doherty, I wanted to share a few comments. In the most recent local election on April 3rd, the voters in Reading turned out in an overwhelming and record-breaking number. 43% of our residents came out to vote. The voters, almost 9,000 of them, decided they best trusted the composition of this committee to conduct an honest, truthful, fair, and comprehensive evaluation of our superintendent. In my professional life, the evaluations that have helped me grow best have been the ones that laid out my areas of strengths and the areas in which I needed to grow and provided me with specific goals and a time frame to achieve them. Glowing evaluations are flattering, but they hinder growth, just as mean-spirited evaluations hinder growth. Evaluations are instruments intended to provide constructive feedback <coughs> to the recipient in a fair, honest, and constructive, professional <coughs> manner. I trust this committee will reflect upon this past year the many successes, the mistakes, <coughs> the challenges, the solutions, all concerns and praise from all representatives of this community and come back to our superintendent with an evaluation that will allow him to grow as a professional and be clear on what areas you expect him to focus and what the timeline is for him to follow. By doing that, you will be coming back to our community and moving us forward in a way in which we can understand. We will know what you expect and we will know what we should expect. As a district, we are finally positioned with the recent passage of the override to move forward. 
One narrative being shared that special education is broken is not true. Special education has some serious problems that are very, very deserving of attention. But it is also comprised of many students with varying disabilities that are making progress. The narrative that's being shared by some that our schools are failing is not true. We have some phenomenal teachers, leaders, and many students who are thriving. We have new senior staff joining our district with valuable skill, experience, and knowledge. And we have areas in need of attention. Absolutely, we have areas that need attention and improvement. Please continue to make yourselves available to all. Every student who goes through the Reading Public Schools will have their own unique experiences, as does every parent of every child. I'm the mother of three Reading Public School students, and each of their experiences has been different. And my experience has varied with each of their teachers and teams. I fully expect those differences to continue and change as our children grow and move through the Reading Public Schools. All experiences are equally important to consider, and I would ask as a committee, you consider each experience that has been shared with you as individuals and as a committee during public comment, office hours, email, conversations, and open meetings. Then evaluate our superintendent as you are charged to do. There are only six people who have that authority. And I, along with the overwhelming majority of the voting public, place my faith and confidence that you will carry out your sworn duty. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Do you put, give you just uh, for the packet. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? We have. Um, now we have. Re <laughs> uh, re re <coughs> uh, we'll do reports first. Or, I'm sorry, yes, consent agenda. Is there anything anyone would like to. Yes, Ms. Dr. I'd like to pull out the ninth, April 9th minutes, please. Anything else? So we'll move to um, approve the consent agenda um, with the April 9th meeting minutes removed. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? <laughs> Five zero. Uh, I would uh, just like to make a point of personal privilege I, we forgot I, we I forgot uh, the last meeting uh, when we were introducing uh, Chris Kelly I forgot to thank her for her years on on ref and and it's and it's uh, predecessor organization the writing technology yeah. foundation and you know that's uh, you know, we'll, you know, we get nervous about her. I mean, she immediately resigned from that, I believe, but or will be June thirtieth. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's uh, you know, that's a lot of time that she's put in this district, and that should have been acknowledged the other night. <coughs> so I apologize for that. Thank you. And then we'll do re Mario. Your turn. All right. Uh, so. Um, oh, we didn't vote. Oh, sorry, I got excited. <laughs> Vote on the consent agenda with five zero. Five zero. Talk about the April ninth. Yeah, the, I was oh, curious why the April 9th minutes. Mm -hmm. right. So I just have to say why what I right. wanted to add. Right. Sorry. So on the April 9th minutes, I just wanted to add Who's that um, Chris Kelly had worked on those committees for ten to fifteen years. I think it was fifteen years. Um, and so I thought it was important to put that in the text, as I had said it at that meeting. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Sorry. Okay. On what page? What, uh, so that um, April 9th. It's April 9th. Page and two. It's on page two. Right above part two. Roman numeral two. Yeah. 
So just basically after it says, um, for all the work she's done over 10 to 15 years while on the Reading Education Foundation Board and Reading Technology Foundation. It's the last paragraph before the bold-faced Mrs. Webb moved. So we'll vote on that the next page. You could do it now. It, it, with those changes, if, you, if you're okay, okay with it. So we'll make a motion to vote on the April 9th meeting minutes um, as amended by Mrs. Doxa on page two. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Five, zero. Okay, now we have reports, Matt. All right. Um, so uh, this week and uh, next week are AP exams. Uh, so uh, today they just started. Um, I know that next week on Tuesday at 7 are the senior, uh, senior awards. Um, this week, I believe, are two band uh, events. Um, tomorrow uh, is a jazz festival, and the 10th um, is the spring concert. Uh, and then also on the 15th next week is the um, AP Art Show. So. so I want to embarrass you, put you on the spot for a minute. What Do you have your plans set for next year? Uh, next year I'm going to UW-Madison. Congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. I have two nephews there. Really? Good for you. Thank you. I'll be a badger. Yeah, go on Wisconsin. Awesome, Mario. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, so as reports, so I'll have one with uh, Dr. Doxer later, um, but um, I had the opportunity to attend the Charting the Course uh, School Committee Induction Program through the Mass Association of School Committees. Of course, it was wonderful, and they had abundant handouts. I've put together a little gift packet for each of my <laughs> fellow members here, of, if you want any reminders from your years past of, you know, motions and, and so on and so forth. And then some literature they also have about some of the legislation they're working on. So I was very grateful for the opportunity to attend that training and I, of course, learned a lot. I've heard you all rave about it. Thank you. Um, so we did have, uh, there was a uh, RACASA meeting uh, last week. It was the same, right. one of the same. The same nights. night as town meeting. Same night as town yeah. meeting. That's right. Um, so the budget, what we did budget. And there was, well, there was considerable dialogue, uh, continued dialogue about the uh, um, issue around vaping. Um, the committee, primarily Mrs. McNamara, is going to work on really putting together sort of a matrix that we can use as a communication tool to help people understand sort of people may not understand, you know, what the school chemical uh, substance abuse policy is and sort of what the consequences are. And so we're going to try to map out something. There were some members of the business community that um, have sort of challenged us to do more work on that. Um, we've talked, you know, one of the big, big issues is the online availability. The vaping market is an $80 billion market. And so it's a significant challenge because um, it's really, it's really the schools do <coughs> not prevent kids from buying things online. So we have to educate parents. Um, we have to educate students. Um, so it's uh, it's very it's really quite sobering. Um, there's a number of pieces of legislation that are um, actually Senator Lewis um, and Rep. Dwyer. Um, have some things in motion that the Bacasa board is going to support and um, look for you know, community support. So I just continue to encourage people for whom these issues are important to um, get on the Bacasa webpage, um, take a look at what's going on at the State House, and there's nothing like continuing to write letters to your state reps and senators about the things that are important to you and the bills that they have in place, whether that be for Wakasa or things relative to school funding. So, um, and just uh, 
Wednesday is the Pulse of Reading, which is something that's been advertised throughout the community. Um, the meeting, the, the session is a World Cafe style dialogue. It's something that's been planned for quite a while. Um, invitations have gone out to a um, significant number of organizations, and it's at the library this time, yep. um, which is a little different than the past. They've been here at the field house. So I would just encourage people who um, you know, want to participate in that dialogue about um, the future of our community and what's important um, to participate in that. And then also upcoming is the uh, Friends and Family Day, which is Saturday, June 16th, which we all will need to talk a little bit about maybe at the end of the meeting um, in terms of having school committee there and represented along with other organizations. So those are two dates to put on your calendar, May 9th, which is this week, and June 16th, which is not this week, but a few weeks away. <laughs> so um, I think that's it. Um, just a little in additional piece of information about the community conversations. This is a first step towards a bigger conversation that will happen in the fall. And there'll be opportunities also to give feedback in between around the questions that are asked. So um, unfortunately, this time, we're limited in space. So um, please RSVP. Everybody is wanted and welcome. And you're... Um, input would be really valued. So um, there's a copy of the invitation in the school committee packet, um, but you can reach out and request from the library who's running this conversation, and they'd gladly um, give more information. I think it might be posted on their site. So just that additional information. Um, I wanted to give an update on the Special Education Parent Advisory Committee. Um, I attended the business meeting on April 10th, and um, it was focused on brainstorming speakers and programs for next year. The CPAC goal is to invite parents in and provide an environment that's both, both informative and supportive. It's important to have somewhere to go where people understand the challenges you are facing and to learn about the district process, services, personnel, <coughs> options. Actually, I want to change that. The um, challenges we are facing, it's everybody faces these challenges, and they're just different for everyone. Um, but there are special challenges also when your children have special needs. Um, this meeting evolved into a wonderful sharing of experiences and ideas. It started with a very informative sharing by BCBA, which is beha um, Behavior Certified, board no, certified. Board, board, certified. board Certified, I always get it wrong when it comes out first, Board Certified Behavioral Analyst, um, Lisa Studer, who um, she talked about her role in the Reading Public Schools and her role with students, parents, and staff. She was surrounded by appreciative parents who were both experienced with her interventions and who were learning like me. She talked about her job and about FBA assessment, which was um, something behavioral assessment. Functional. functional. Functional behavioral assessment. Thank you. I had that written down yeah. somewhere else. Then she got into the practical concerns of what to do to ensure a successful positive vacation. It was really applying the theory to the action, and everybody got into it. Vacation is both anticipated with happiness and trepidation. Families and children rely on the supports and the routines of their everyday life to keep behaviors positive. Vacations can create change that can be challenging. So Ms. Studer discussed why this is difficult as well as approaches that can help, including <laughs> engaging folks in discussing a list of places that are supportive for families with special needs during vacation and other times. Um, empathy filled the room when folks were talking about their efforts to pre-plan vacation activities. What follow through was like it didn't always work the way people anticipated. And what backup plans were kept in their back pockets. Um, 
and Ms. Studer shared her own. So it was really powerful. There was a lot of sharing that went on. The efforts, caring, and devotion of these parents and of Ms. Studer was really inspiring. I left there thinking what a wonderful opportunity for parents to find a community of support and information and how important it is that I give you these reports as the liaison to the Special Education Parent Advisory Committee after each meeting. Just perchance someone will hear and decide to attend the meetings. Um, so they also had a meeting on, um, well, there's another business meeting coming up on the 14th. Um, that's going to be a business meeting. It's going to be at the public library. Mm -hmm. And there was also another meeting on um, the 25th. And I wasn't able to go, so Ms. Wilson was going to talk a little bit about that meeting. Um, when you do your report? Yeah, when I do okay. my report. Thanks. Okay, so um, another announcement that I wanted to report I wanted to give was the quick ones. There will be a Reading Embraces diversity meeting at White Land Bookstore on May 16th at 7, that's 610 Main Street. It is an accessible store. Um, the button, for the, they're working on the accessibility button, but there is a ramp going in. So um, we're trying very hard to make sure that all spaces where the meetings are accessible. Um, okay, and the MASC meeting, the Mass Association of School Committees meeting, as um, Mrs. Vandenacker said, was at the State House and also at the Veterans something around the corner from there. The Mason's Lodge. Mason's Lodge, thank you. Um, so there we listened to informational <coughs> sessions about the issues and challenges public schools are facing, including Chapter 70 and special education, circuit breaker funding, transportation aid, things we've been talking about here throughout our budget talks. Thank you very much. Um, METCO funding, the Children's Services Safety Net, early education programs, charter school reform, unfunded mandates. We were welcomed by um, Jim Dwyer and Senator Jason Lewis. Unfortunately, um, Representative Brad Jones wasn't available, but he actually sent me a letter afterwards. Um, and um, so we left him a note and, invitation and information. And I believe we have packets for each, right, of the cards yes. for each of the school committee. Part of my gift bag for each right. of you has <laughs> the cards. And I yes. didn't know if you wanted to add it. No, about. just the, again, it was a wonderful day to meet with other school committees in the area and across the state and to see that the issues that uh, challenge us are the same that challenge other communities too. So. We went to a, I went to um, a meeting with Senator Lewis with Stoneham and they had a whole contingent there including students who had prepared their statements for the Senator. <coughs> and it was really wonderful to be a part of that conversation. The students were really empowered by have, being able to speak directly to their Senator. So I'm really hoping that next year, this happens annually, that next year we'll be able to invite some students to go with us. And their special ed director yes. was there too who knew and spoke wonderful things of Miss Wilson. Um, okay. Um, there also was a contingent of six Reading people that went um, to the anti-racism in the suburbs conference on um, two Saturdays ago, which was really interesting um, and really optimistic and gave us some skills to think about. Um, I also wanted to report on, um, very briefly, on the Upstander pro program that was initiated by <coughs> the university that was presented to, uh, which engaged um, 10th and 11th grade students in thinking about the challenges and the strategies for being someone that engages to help someone when they see something negative happening. Um, and so it's the opposite of being a passive bystander, rather being a, an upstander. Um, so we had wonderful leadership from um, Zach Brokenrope, teachers from the high school, Zach Brokenrope, um, Leah Richardson and um, Michelle Hopkinson, Michelle being health and wellness for the high school, Leah being a um, English teacher, language arts teacher, and Zach being a his history teacher? Yeah. I think. Language, language arts. Language arts too, yeah. sorry. 
Um, they were awesome, um, really engaging, and this is the first of the beginning. <coughs> sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy. Um, this is the first um, of many initiatives that will come. The upstanders, the students, 20, 28 students, somewhere 28, 30 students are already planning their next meetings um, and what they're going to do. And there's going to be a, another program by Mrs. Richardson that's been initi initiated by Mrs. Richardson called Unity. And you'll learn more about that. I think it was in one of the pathways coming up. Um, another follow-up to that is also going to be the, um, 11th and 12th graders are going to be able to hear Dr. Ornstein, the Holocaust survivor and child psychiatrist who is coming this Thursday to the high school. Um, and the 9th and 10th graders already heard her a couple of months ago or a month ago. Um, this is, oh, and one last thing. I was so privileged to be able to go to Charlotte's Web and actually take um, a young friend of mine. It was magical. It was. The work that this high school does, mm -hmm. the drama club does, and um, from set to acting to student director to lights and sound, this production was exemplary of what students can do and teachers inspire with very little funds. Afterwards, I was having a conversation with them. They had to figure out, on like no funds, what to do for the set. And Stephen McDonald went and thought about the pallets that are thrown out outside all of the schools and went and collected the pallets. And that's what they used, for those of you that saw that play, that's what they used to build the set. So the pallets were all free. All of that wood would have gone into the trash and they used it for this purpose and just so people are know people know the students are required to spell, spend 6 hours working on off stage responsibilities so building the sets costumes publicity whatever it is and so they help build that set they help make those plays happen it's not top down everybody participates in making it what it was and it was um, it made me cry it made me laugh and um, I'm so proud of all of them. So thank you for Natalie, to Natalie Kuna, all the parents that made it happen, um, and the students. And the story itself is very poignant about how important friendship is and how you can be an upstander and stick your neck out to help a friend. So, um, so uh, and sometimes that saves a life. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I I, uh, I forgot to mention the ref gala, but I didn't know if the superintendent was going to mention that. His no, I was no? Okay. okay. So, and since you brought up ref, so ref had its annual gala on April 28th, and as always, it was a wonderful experience. And thank you to all the parents and community members and businesses who helped support our schools through that activity. It was marvelous. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Right, so I just have a brief update. I'll be doing a more comprehensive update for the committee on May 21st. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was included in your packet is a letter from Desi indicating that we have qualified for extraordinary relief through the Circuit Breaker Program. Um, this program offers additional financial support to districts who demonstrate that their costs have increased by 25% or more from the previous claim that was um, completed to DESE. So I think um, this provided an outside lens <coughs> looking at our out-of-district costs and our in-district costs to support those things we've been talking about through the budget process and some of the changes we've had. Um, this did require a great deal of work, so I'd like to thank my administrative assistant, Anne Marie Foley. Um, she did a tremendous amount of work to put together the claim, as well as Karen Rando. She's one of our occupational therapists, and she is working towards getting her administrator license. So she put some time in after school to learn about the process and um, to help with that claiming process because it does require um, a lot of attention to detail because we have to submit documentation of both students who we incur costs for who are placed out of district as well as for claims of students who are in district based on their IEP. So it's a lot of detail that needs to go into the claim in order to um, get the additional funding. So um, we do have to spend that um, those funds by June 30th um, and we've begun planning uh, how we're going to do that. 
So um, the next piece is um, the assistant director position has been posted. Um, and I am in the process of putting together a screening committee which will include teachers, administrators, and parents. Um, the first round interviews will be on May 14th. Um, after reflecting on the structure we originally proposed and speaking to Kelly Boswick, our RISE preschool director, and Dr. Doherty, we made a decision to restructure the position. It won't have any financial imp implications, more in how what we're going to attach to the assistant director. Um, the preschool director position is really a principle for RISE preschool, and there's a lot of day-to-day -day management. And as you know, we're going to be expanding RISE to three sites for next year, which wasn't something we were thinking about when we were going to <coughs> the assistant director and the RISE preschool director together. Um, so in thinking about all the responsibilities and speaking to Ms. Boswick, it became clear that the preschool director really wouldn't have as much time to do the assistant director responsibilities. So for the 18-19 school year, the proposal is to have the assistant director attached to Woodend as the team chair. So the assistant director would be team chair for Wood End. Right now, as you know, we have someone who's there two days a week. Mm -hmm. It's our smaller school, although it has um, two of our special education programs. We feel that this will allow the assistant director to actually have time in their schedule to do some of the other responsibilities that we're really looking for. Um, I think it's important to remind to each year to revisit how that is combined based on our enrollment and what our needs are of our students, based on what our needs are at each building, that it's not something we say this is a forever assignment, but that it's always looked at um, because it's important that the position be effective to meet the goals that we have for this to mm -hmm. position to support our students, our families, and our staff. So um, my proposal for 1819, the way we're structuring it, is to have it um, paired with Wood End um, for that school year. But you know, throughout next school year, I'll provide you updates on how that's going and um, if we're going to continue that. We currently have 19 applicants for the position, which is very exciting. Um, and we're hoping to interview six to seven applicants through the screening committee and then have some opportunities for some other sessions with staff and parents after we narrow that down to some finalists. So I'm excited about the candidate pool um, and, and moving the process forward. And then finally, as um, Dr. Doxer mentioned, the CPAC meeting on April 25th, Nancy Dugan from Decoding Dyslexia presented. We had a full house um, in the library here at the high school. She shared research on reading development and information on reading interventions. Um, she also provided parents with a goal planning document that can be used for developing reading goals in at IEP meetings. So some of the information that she shared um, with family, we have staff there as well. I've shared that key information with our staff um, so they were able to get that information. And as was mentioned, our next CPAC meeting is the 14th at 7 p.m. at Reading Memorial Library. Mine will be covered later. Dr. I have a few things. Thank you. Um, first of all, and I, this was sent out on Saturday um, throughout all of our different communication <coughs> tools that um, pleased to announce that Kathleen Boynton has been appointed as the new principal of Reading Memorial High School. And um, as most of you know, this has been the second search that we have done for this position. We've had a total over 40 applicants. Uh, for the position, the screening committee. Um, it was essentially the same screening committee. The only change the second time around is that we did have the school resource officer, Brian Lewis, join the screening committee. Um, but it was essentially the same screening committee. And through the process, there were over 40 applications. Um, the screening committee did interview 15, uh, 16 of those uh, over the two different processes. Um, in this last round, uh, they forwarded, and it was it was a very strong group um, that was interviewed by the screening committee. Um, they forwarded it to me um, a group of final pre finalists, and then we um, did some individual interviews with them, and then based on that, we had three finalists, which we had last week, as you know, the open microphone sessions <coughs> in both the afternoon with staff and then the evening with the community. The next day they spent the morning, the three finalists spent the morning at 
uh, Reading Memorial High School, they got interviewed by students. <coughs> Sorry, they got interviewed by department heads. Um, the district leadership team um, and took a tour of the school, visited classrooms, and then had subsequent uh, follow up and reference checks after that. And you know, Miss Miss Boynton was a very consistent interviewer, and throughout the entire process, uh, got some very strong feedback, positive feedback from both community and staff. Um, she is currently the assistant principal at Bedford High School in Bedford. She's currently in a doctoral program at UMass Lowell, has a Master of Arts in Secondary Education in History from Boston College, and she has a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations from American University. Earlier in her career, uh, before she was at Bedford, she was a program co-leader for the Brookline Global Leadership Academy for the Brookline Public Schools at Brookline High School, and she was an instructional resource specialist for the History and Social Studies departments and a history and social studies teacher at Brockton High School. Uh, in her current role, she is the lead assistant principal for the STEP Full Inclusion Program for students with social and emotional disabilities and the Lighthouse Program for students transitioning to school from long absences at Bedford High School. Um, I do want to thank the, the community for their feedback um, during the process. It obviously was very helpful um, to me in the decision-making process. Um, Kathleen I spoke to on Friday and uh, signed, she signed her contract. She's very excited to begin on July 1st. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to Jen who uh, facilitated both of these searches. Um, when it's all said and done, we'll, we'll have done four searches this year. I'll explain the last search in a little bit. Um, but I want to thank Jen for her for the job she's done. I've heard a lot of positive feedback from the candidates about how effective and efficient and professional these searches have been run, and that's because of the work that Jen does behind the scenes. <coughs> so I want to welcome Kathleen to our school district. Um, I also want to mention that the Department of Environmental Protection Drinking Water Program is pleased to inform us that the Reading Public Schools has won the Systems Taking Action to Reduce Lead Award. So MassDEP recognizes the effort that we have taken, and this is a collaborative effort, I want to say, between the Reading School Department and the Reading Water Department. All of our water testing is done by the Reading Water Department, um, and it has for several years. And as you know, a couple of years ago, we actually went beyond what the state has required us to do, and um, we do a third of our school's uh, water testing every single year, and we'll continue to do that this summer. Um, so. I just wanted to recognize the work that our water department has done and I want to thank them for all their, their hard work and us receiving this recognition from the Department of Environmental Protection. John, it's just that with the school department, that was also the facilities department too, was that correct or was it just the water department? The uh, the water department does the water testing. Okay. Yes, but certainly yes. You're you're right. The facilities department, the school department. Yes, when I said together, school department, I meant school and facilities. Yes. Yeah. School and what facilities. role does the MWRA play in that? They they don't. Right. They don't. Not in not in this. No, they don't. Right. I remember being incredibly impressed with um, at some of the meetings more than a year, year and a half ago with the whoever the representatives were from the water department um, were just, just there so was, uh, outstanding. Eric, Eric Maislicki. So really outstanding, very professional, and was able to sort of explain some of the complexities of the water testing and the chemistry of the water and what was going on and, and do it in a way that was made it easy for the parents and community members that were there to understand. So it was excellent. Um, I also want to report out um, an update on the NIAS process. So, <coughs> so um, this year the high school staff has had a steering committee. Essentially, this is year one of the of the NIAS process. As you know, we are we are piloting the new NIAS process, um, which um, has not been done by many school districts. So we're in we're in. Uh, you know, different territory here, but as part of this process, there is a ste steering committee led by two teachers, um, and what they've been doing is a review of the standards, the NIAS standards, throughout the year with staff. 
<coughs> as part of this process, there is a step called the Collaborative Conference. And the Collaborative Conference visit has been established for Thursday, November 8th, um, and Friday, November 9th. So this is a new step in the accreditation process. The purpose of this is to gather information about the current conditions of the school, to collaboratively review and refine the school's self-reflection findings, and the identified priority areas for growth and improvement. So this actually, with a new principal coming on board, this is an excellent step for that new principal to get the information that she needs in working with her staff on identifying the strengths of the high school and areas that need to be strengthened. It's very similar to what Mrs. Sanfi was talking about earlier, because that's what we want to keep doing. Um, you know, in, in continuous improvement. So I just wanted to update you on that. Can I ask a quick question about that? Yes. Hold on. So, oh, okay, sorry. No, we might be asking the same question. Oh, okay. I just wondered, um, can you say, so the collaborative conference, is that high school staff plus the NEASC evaluators? NEASC brings in uh, Site, uh, site visit yep. people, yeah. And, and to meet with high, uh, contingent high school. High staff. school, yep. So like a group, like administrators and teachers and staff. Correct. Or the whole. They spend, they spend a day plus here. Yeah, the two days it sounds like. So yep. Yeah, okay. And do you know if there's a, compu a community component to that? I, I do not know. I don't okay. have the details Thank you. of that. I know it's a new process. So. Yeah, my, my question was whether there would be a role for us in that process because that's also the mm -hmm. Mass Association of School Committees conference. Is those days? Yeah, I, I I don't have those those details. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And then the uh, <coughs> the only other piece I want to talk about all of the positive things that happened with the um, support of the override. There is one piece that impacts the schools um, that isn't part of the school department budget. Well, there's many things, but one that will be very visible next year is that there will be a second school resource officer. Um, so I, um, in conversations that we've had with Chief Sagala, we will begin the process to identify a new school resource officer soon. Um, in most likely that school resource officer will uh, be housed at Parker Middle School next year. Uh, so we will have one here at the high school and one housed at, at Parker Middle School um, for the, the start of the next school year. So we are working on all of those details and in, in also the interview process and that will be happening this spring as we move forward. <coughs> Yeah. When, you say, when you say housed at Parker, will he go between, he or, or she, she go between? So our school resource officers go to all the schools. Yeah. Um, that's been made very clear by what uh, Officer Lewis and um, Officer Mulo uh, and Officer Santaski and Officer Abadi prior. Um, so uh, the, the purpose of having a central location is so that they can have an office where they have access um, you know, to computer and uh, technology and, and other other things that they need in their day-to-day -day roles as school resource officer. It also, in theory, you know, now has coverage, quote unquote, on both sides of town. Makes sense. But they will be they will be going to all the schools. Thank you. Thank you. And that's that's our reports. Thank you. Uh, We'll do the uh, personnel update. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, so this is the third quarter for Snow Report um, for fiscal year 18. As you can tell, I'm sure it's um, a lot smaller than some of the previous, uh, but I'll still go through it. Um, so this is for um, relevant dates between February 27th, 2018 through uh, May 7th, 2018. As you can see, we still have that chart up top just outlining um, those conversions of those FTEs uh, to help guide you through the, the tables. We have hired uh, three new employees during that time frame. Um, as you can see, and again, an explanation as to what we mean in terms of um, professional employees that we've hired. So if you head down to table one, um, you'll see there uh, the new hires are outlined. Um, what we also have added this time around is a total FTEs. I think last time um, there was a request for that. So moving forward, hopefully that will help to... Um, to clarify when we have some of the more charts and some of the, the bigger reports. Um, 
Um, so if you move forward to table two, as you can see, of the newly hired positions, um, all of those were budgeted positions. So by that, someone, stereotypically what that looks like is someone has left that position um, and we have filled it. So uh, nothing new added in any way. Um, and then table three is our current open job requisitions. And again, this is current for, um, for this school year. So we do obviously have some positions out there right now that we have posted for that are for next school year uh, that we don't report on within um, the dates in the time frame of this third quarter report. Um, and uh, we also do not have any uh, teacher resignations as well for this time frame as well for this report. So you won't see a table there for that. Um, and we had no restructured positions, no new. I know we had some tables like that in previous reports because again, these positions were budgeted uh, that we hired for. So it's relatively straightforward. Um, but if you have any questions, I can take those. So it's not Rena. Didn't Rena Angelou already work on the business? Yes. <laughs> Oh, it says newly high. <laughs> oh, she um, at one point, yes. Oh, she. Oh, she. Yes. She, she was, came back. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize she had. Left. <laughs> yes, and then came yep. back. So. Yes. So table one equals table two. All the new hires yep. were backfilling positions yeah. that were budgeted and yep. filled by vacancy. Yep. Explain the origin of the table three positions. Yep. So all of those are budgeted. So again, by that, all of those, there was someone currently in that role who has left the district for a various reason um, and is currently still open that we need to fill. So none of those are new. Um, none of those are restructured in any way. So why? So they, they all link to a. Why aren't they in table two? Because they haven't been hired. Because they, they're, they haven't been hired. They're, they're open. open. So table two reflects of the people that we have hired and of the positions that we have filled. Those were budgeted positions. Right, yeah, it just, just it just said for which a vacancy occurred in table two. So there's a vacancy for table three and a vacancy for two. But the right table one is what we've hired. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And I'm trying to show you that of what we've hired. Mm -hmm. That's those were the budgeted Maybe positions. The title should just say budgeted and filled because the sure, table yeah. two is okay. the budgeted positions that were filled by table one. Correct. Hired. So yes. budgeted and so and yeah. filled versus. That's a different thing. Budgeted, yep. but still open. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then table three is budgeted and vacant. Correct. Yeah. Are they all backfill positions? Like, was someone in these positions before, or are they new positions? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, okay. So, How long okay. have they been? Um, mm -hmm. Our, you'll see our, um, which we had a discussion on the previous personnel report that I had done, the first position you'll see there, the Special Education Therapeutic Support Program teacher. Mm -hmm. um, that has been a position that we have posted numerous times um, and kind of historically not even really within our district, kind of around is a tough position to fill. Um, but we ha do have a um, current paraeducator para who has worked with the program consistently previously who we've placed into that role and is acting in that role along with some other teacher supports within that program. So if I add these up, it's about five FTE out of about 550, so it's under 1% turn. I mean, if you, yeah, I can't give you the, ex I can't All attest, part. I guess, to the exact percentage, yeah, but I would say yes, this is a very, it's my very low turn open, yes, that's good. yes, yeah, at this, that's good. yeah. So, Maybe Carol can ask. So the the TSP teacher. What's the? I mean, is it is it compensation that we're not competitive, or, or there's just not a lot of? It's it's a unique position. Yes, it's yeah. our therapeutic support program. So it was a mid year leave yep. that we weren't anticipating. So it's been hard to fill during the school year. We've posted it for next year, and I think they have some strong candidates for the position to hire someone for next year. So I think it's challenging to fill positions like that mid year. Okay. Um, yes. That that wasn't one. Um, it w it's always a one FTE. It wasn't one that we. No. Had no yeah, that was always a, a one point now a full time. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Thank All you. All right. Thank you guys. You gotta sit up there. <laughs> I'm very comfortable here.
Thanks, Jen. So to follow on with that, what we've included in the packet is the third quarter budget update. So this was using payroll data and information as of April 5th. So just to give a little context to it. So as of this current projection, we have about a $264,000 surplus, which is in line with what we had shown last time. Some of the changes results as Jen's mentioned, as we continue to have positions open during the year, I always project that we will be filling them. So as the year goes on, to the extent the positions remain open or new positions open up, those salary savings sort of start to fall to the bottom line because there's less of a time for us to fill them. Um, what also is reflected, as you know, we have done two budget transfers into the special education call center. So all of that information is reflected on here as well. We are not currently projecting any additional transfers being needed at this point. Um, Carol and I are actually now meeting every other week or weekly from now until the end of the year to go through where we are with consultation, tutoring, transportation, and tuition. So we actually had a good meeting mm -hmm. today to fine tune the numbers. To tag on a little bit to what was mentioned earlier, we did receive, which very excited, the circuit breaker funding. So we met earlier today to talk about that. And currently the plan is to look at individuals that we currently have in the projection that are within the operating budget to move them on to the circuit breaker funding. As you know, typically we have one year in reserve for circuit breaker. So even though this is FY18 funding, we actually are not allowed to carry this over into next year because it is extraordinary relief. We actually have to spend it down in the current year. So our plan is to take individuals off of the operating budget and move them on to the circuit breaker. And the plan is to utilize that funding for prepayments into next year. As we talked about through the budgeting process, there was a shortfall in the out of district transportation. We were hopeful to have extraordinary relief or additional funding and increase in the percentage. So now we're able to start to move towards that plan. So our goal is to be able to prepay, which will help alleviate some of the pressures for next year. So one of the, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it was the last update we moved 200,000 from regular day mm -hmm. over to special, special ed. ed. Now, as we wouldn't uh, give that some of that back through that 154? Right now, what we've been monitoring is some of the, we have had open positions as well as some teachers that are now on unpaid leave. So the thought would be, to the extent we have some of that additional money, we could look to transferring some of that back to regular ed as we sit down and look at all of our projected year-end spending to determine what the best utilization of those funds would be. We also <coughs> had originally anticipated that the circuit breaker extraordinary relief we would be able to utilize next year to help offset the $140,000 deficit we know we had budgeted. And originally we thought we'd be able to use the circuit breaker funding next year to help offset that. So our initial goal was to be able to still utilize that funding to help offset next year's. But that's part of where we're meeting each week to look at all of the other line items to see if there are other pockets of funding that become available and then working with. Where are we with the uh, the per pupil? Are the, how are the, are we holding back some of that? Building. The building, building. The building base, budget. we are still holding back that amount, so we will be releasing half of it this week, so after we gave this update, and then the remainder would be released at the end of the month. We're working with, we've met with all of the building principals, and they know how much they have, and we're actually working through all of the ordering, as well as looking at um, Julian Carr on the IT side, we've been working with all of the buildings to go through our inventory of all of the technology. So we also have the list. So we are now compiling all of that as well as any curriculum 
materials. So over the last week, we've been meeting with all of the building principals, the lead principals, and we have additional meetings, not next week, but the, the week, week after. after. To go through all of that, which is why as of right now, we're not doing transfers yet until we can see where all of the pieces come into to place because there's still a few from um, tuition and transportation that we're just waiting for final definitive agreement so we can lock down as much of that as possible. At your June 18th meeting, you'll be, if there's any transfers that need to be made, you'll be making them then? We just thought it would be easier to do sort of one final transfer at that point once we had the plans all worked out. We are also still monitoring the revolving accounts and as of right now we are confident in the revolving account balances that we'll be able to take the offsets. The last one we're working with is um, the extracurricular knowing they just had the show this past weekend um, but we did review all of the others and are, are comfortable with the balances so now it'll just be over the next month to look at any additional revenues that come in or expenses that go out. The other part, so one of the areas where we have had savings that we'll be looking at is when within the administration cost center. So majority of that is from the results of the open assistant superintendent position and also from the funding we had put in for the school business assistant. Happy to report we've received about 30 resumes on that. So we are in the process um, now that Jen has finished one search, we'll sort of move to another one. Um, so not next week, but the week after, we'll be having individuals come in. So we feel confident that by the end of June, we will have somebody in place for that position as well. So we're happy with the number of resumes that have been coming in over the past few weeks on, on that one. Um, also, what we have reflected in here is um, making sure we have substitute coverage for all of the buildings because that is one area where we had reduced the budget so we've worked with all of the building principals on that. We've also restored the technology funding so the $50,000 that we had removed from the budget is reflected being replenished in here so we are making sure we're looking at items that had been cut and restoring them and we also have a placeholder currently for I'll say this wrong, um, the classroom yeah. safety backpack the backpack so we've asked each of the building principals to go through and we're compiling a list of the various supplies and items we would need because our goal would be to also look to replenish that this year <coughs> Oh. Yes. Um, so the uh, thanks for the update. First of all, so the um, ninety-six thousand dollar special education projected um, under at this point um, is that, so that I understand that includes the, what the money we've transferred from regular day in the past. Does it also reflect the circuit breaker or not yet? The, I mean, the extraordinary relief money. The or not circuit yet? breaker has not. So the sorry, the, just the ninety-six 000. is actually in reg as in reg. surplus. The oh, right reg? now it's no, currently I'm forty-eight sorry. thousand. Yeah, for it, special ed. I apologize. Yeah, I'm we, online. But that does that include the it extraordinary? Does relief? not include not the yet. extraordinary relief yet because we had just mm -hmm. received the notification and we were working yeah. through the time because okay. what gets tricky is. We need to make sure we sort of get the cash in yep. hand, and we were clarifying yeah, what when we needed to spend it down. Right. Yeah. By. So what did the state say? May in sometime in May, it's coming. Or it something? should be they coming. Think? It says end of April. This is oh, yeah, yeah. projection. Yeah, and this was yeah, but they're good for it. What had happened with this one? <laughs> hopefully, that is this had been completed for early April before we had moved to the April school committee meeting. So this was sort oh, this of update. Mm -hmm. It was updated yeah. before we received okay. mm -hmm. this okay. notification. So we met this morning to start to walk through yeah. the process for that as well. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. So the charts that you provided here on page two, um, just some people may have questions about those. So the bottom chart is the detailed per cost center Correct. surplus. And the top chart is a summary. It has the same total number, right, at the bottom. So it's the same money. 
it's a different representation of the same picture, right? Correct. And by expense, thank you. And so we have salary savings in the, that in that first chart, and those are allocated in differing amounts in the cost centers below, right? Correct. And then the special education on salary is that an accommodated cost, or does that fit into the special? Because you have two numbers for you: number a deficit yep. of eighty-five k on top, and a surplus of forty-eight k in the bottom. We moved what four hundred k already yes. in two tranches. So and this is all sort of reflective. That. This is after we did all of the budget right. transfers. Right. So the item up above would be a combination of accommodated and non-accommodated. So that would include legal services, home tutoring transportation, tuition. The special education non-salary. Yes, so it's everything okay. in special education excluding the salaries. Which is in the so I've included number. salaries across the district in the first number, but I thought it would be helpful to break out special education from sort of the other expense mm -hmm. items that you see. So the 85k deficit for non-salary plus the salary surplus gets you to the 48. Correct. So, the and box. really, the salary surplus is That's a combination of employees yeah. who have it's turnover. Turnover. We've well, had some un unpaid, unpaid unfilled positions, unpaid, leave. positions, mm -hmm. unpaid leaves of absence, as well as um, in reviewing a couple of the grants, we were able to, based upon the timing of when we received the IDEA grant, we were able to capture a little bit more salary out of the operating budget onto the grants as well. So it's a combination of all of those that has improved the picture there. So one, one if I could stay on the specialization, more, more questions. So the, I remember moving, I, was, was that right? It was two 200K amounts yes. roughly, and I, and I remember Two things from that conversation, I don't know if it's been a while. One was that the shortfall in circuit breaker compared to what we budgeted versus what we received, and I know it's a year ahead, but we're, we're budgeting for FY19 at the time. Was that shortfall for FY18 or was that for FY19? FY19. Right. What so that's not these numbers. Right? That's not these numbers. What did happen in FY18, which was why we needed to do the transfers, was the difference between when you're in 18 now when we had done the budget a year earlier right. so back 17. in October a year ago 17. we had used yeah. those numbers for tuition 16. number of students and placements right. right and the same for tuition and transportation when we moved forward 12 plus months the population had changed placements had changed in tuition rates, in transportation rates had changed. So we had a shortfall in transportation and tuition. What also happened, and please correct me if I missed a beat or kick me under the table, um, in the home tutoring and consultative services, because of some of the open positions we had, mm -hmm. we needed to outsource it, and those were at a higher rate right. than we had budgeted That's for correct. salary. So yeah. it was <coughs> a combination of all of that, as well as some of the salary deficits were due to the sub-separate classroom for RISE, RISE that we needed to add FTEs from teachers as well as paras. And then what we also talked about last update is that at Killam, mm -hmm. we added additional staffing to be able to do some of the 45-day placements mm -hmm. internally. So those were all of the various reasons we did the transfers earlier in the year. Right. And my recollection is about half of the amount, over 200000 was due to down to district transportation. Correct. Yep. Yes. Now, is that with us for good, or was that a, is that something we're building into our budget projections? That, that is that was something a we event? built into the... At the time we were building next year's budget, we did not know if it was a one-time event because as we were monitoring it, we weren't seeing a significant decrease. So we did build that into next year's 19. budget, yeah. into 19 budget. The only thing we hadn't fully built in was the tuition, and that's where we were cautiously optimistic we would get the circuit breaker extraordinary really? relief. So we felt we had a couple of avenues that we would be able to Mm -hmm. Use for next year for the areas we hadn't fully budgeted, so and we're still hopeful the reimbursement rate will go up from the 65 to the. Rumor has it it may be getting increased, but we know yeah, by it's already the 72 percent. We haven't seen the final the governor numbers has not yet, signed yet. so uh, we're uh -huh. optimistic. That's, I don't believe he signed it yet. He hasn't I'm, signed it yeah, yet. Yeah, and I think that's 
the, what's been waiting. The files that we're still receiving. <coughs> are Do still you know what it ended up being when you add the 154 to what we got? What the final percentage was? Or? For this well, year, I have not done that yet. Just curious. But I can look at what that. Matter. But it. This it's the two different categories. Is a so you don't want to. Yeah, which yeah, you got to be careful with that. That's a one-time event that yeah. does right. not get built into right. the and it doesn't no, get yeah, I'm curious for which would yeah. be nice, but yeah. Yeah. no, and it doesn't get taken away from next year's. Like when we yeah. do a claim in July, this doesn't impact that. So oh, it doesn't. It doesn't go against. No, no, it no, doesn't, doesn't go against. It's not a loan. This is to say. <laughs> this is saying we had expenses that were at least twenty-five percent more than when we, we did our claim last July, and we were able to document that, which is why we qualify to get extra money for, to use this current year. So, last question I have on special ed budget: the the one fifty-four k from Extraordinary Relief that Chuck is referencing, and there's a letter in the packet about that amount for people that may be wondering where we're getting that. The, how close does that come to filling in for the unexpected increase in cost? Because I don't think it covers the entire unexpected increase. So it's about 150 out of 400 or 150 out of 200 or... I just want people to be clear that this, this doesn't fix the... I, it does not fix, so the, we, the, I would say about... The added cost like, we've, we've experienced. It does not because there are certain right. hurdles you have to get over and then it's a reimbursement based right. upon that. So I would say... It's like 200, right? It's about 200, yeah. So we got 150 out of 200 in a one time. Or, in this is purely tuition this did not help offset the transportation, transportation. because yeah. that's not part yeah. of circuit breaker this. only does tuition right okay. it would be nice if right. it included both but the circuit breaker and this extraordinary relief is only tuition, tuition. It's only tuition yeah, it does not go towards yes, the transportation and then we can only prepay one quarter in 19 we can the? only pay three months into next year mm -hmm. so but we'll be able to fund that at a level that we might not have been able to fund now because of right this now we program. had originally right. with these projections we had not anticipated being able to, to fund pay right. any so, amount so if it right. this will help this, this will help right. give us so, some prepayment right I mean I think our processes help <coughs> us build in some budget certainty and stability and it's you know a, 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 I think a credit to the that we've had them in place for some period of time because mm -hmm. It, it really makes a big difference to us. And this is really significant to help us stay on track with right. that. Yes. And again, a lot of that will be over the next three, six, nine, two months. Yeah. Really looking at all of the various areas and what makes mm -hmm. the most sense for us to do. Good. Any other questions? Did you have a question? Yeah, I just wondered. Oh. Rebecca Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. Um, is VHS going to come back, given that the override passed? No, VHS was not part of the override funding. Okay, thanks. Yeah. This, this is more just clarifying. So I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. The circuit breaker, okay? okay. So <laughs> I'm just using a hypothetical, okay? Say it's 40000 has to be over, mm -hmm. right? You can't include transportation costs in that. No. I did not know that. No, yeah. no, no, transportation. no transportation. Okay, so we it need more help Never, never has been yeah. that. I didn't it's know that never either. Been transportation. And it is... And it's a service delivery, so yeah. it's based on students' service delivery grids and their IEPs. So for in-district students, you claim their IEP mm -hmm. and their I every IEP that's happened over the course of, so you have an understanding of this from um, July 1 to June 30th. Mm -hmm. Every time there was an amendment, you claim each one separately. What what my mind is thinking is that we are mandated to provide transportation, mm -hmm. yeah. but we're not receiving any assistance Correct. for that. The only and we're not the only district that is. No, a I'm sure it's across the Commonwealth. <laughs> the, it's range. troubling. The only assistance, if you want to call it, that, <coughs> that we receive from the state is tied to homeless transportation, yeah. right. not okay, not That's adoption, it. not for not special education, special education, not. Um, it's purely. If it's documented as homeless, we get a slight reimbursement. But not a lot. So the transportation is an unfunded it is. mandate. 
yes. unfunded mandate. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Sorry, we're question with the revolving accounts. Um, so extended day revolving account looks good. Yes, we, I we, think we are, dropped the rates for that to keep the extended day. We decreased the rates. So Sandy and um, I have been visiting that. We have all, so we decreased the rates. We also have increased um, some of the special education services that we are being provided through that. So Sandy and I are meeting again. We do know it's going to take a little bit of time, but we have we, we are seeing a decrease in what, that. What is well, the, the good problem. news? The good news is the enrollment keeps going up. Yeah. So they are actually looking for ways to right. potentially yeah, increase the number right. of students. Where so we're sort good. of monitoring that as well to make sure that I can also put in as much staffing and enrichment. Right. So just the we're meeting our requirement to carefully look at the, what we charge for any services, yes. and we're keeping our balances in our revolving account compliant. So and we and are, sometimes that involves lowering rates. As, yes. Right, well, as so we are so. doing the same thing. I've asked um, the facilities rentals coordinator to come up with shorter titles. We are also starting to look at use of school properties as well to revisit sort of how that process as well so we're sort of going through each revolving account to make sure that we're doing that Just on the extended day is that um, those rates also those fees parents are eligible for the, no. so not on not the same as with no they the they can apply um, through the state but, there's a state um, but oh. no it is not the same not system as it would be for day. full day K no. or oh, right, not for lunch and yeah. full day K okay yeah. Uh, Chuck mentioned the changing topics again, the uh, building-based budgets, which is about 680K. Um, the holdback, is that 15% or 30%? We do 30% this year, mainly because we had also reduced their building-based budgets. Right. When we, we cut 100000 from the building-based budget, so right. we withheld 30%. So that's about 200K? Correct. So we withheld 200 and we're in about what, May? In June, left we have two months out of the year left, and we have 30% or 200K in those. Okay. And those orders, for the most part, will be being placed this month. And, okay. and those orders, just so you know, those are more for, for next year. We've always done that cycle to help give, it actually helps us more of an 18 month purchase cycle. Okay. Um, it's been, it's really been helpful to the buildings over the years to do it that way. And we work very closely with them, so it, I don't want to say it becomes mechanical because we're very strategic about what we do, but I can say with pretty high level of confidence that if I told them today to place the orders, they're, they're ready. The orders they're ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll, uh, are you doing the surplus? I am. I'm starting to roll. So one of the other memo that we have in here, so what we... Actually, we're going to have a motion. For yeah. this. Um, move to declare the obsolete school technology listed in the Director of Finance's memorandum dated May 4th, 2018 as surplus property. Second. Second. Is there a second? Sure. Mm -hmm. So one of the items, and I apologize, we had um, Julian was unable to make it tonight, so I will do my best IT impersonation. So we have been working very closely um, across, across the district to go through and look and make sure any surplus items we are gathering and, and getting in front of uh, school committee. So Julian and I have been working very closely with his IT individual as well as the tech integrators at all of the schools to go through especially as we're getting ready to purchase and deploy new equipment to make sure we're getting a good inventory of the surplus equipment so the list you have here is majority of our older equipment and what is happening with these we have a very good process to go through where before anyone can order new equipment we do a pretty thorough analysis as poor Carolyn can attest to who still has an old computer <laughs> to make sure that we've assessed it a lot of these when you look at the keyboards and the monitors are keyboards that have missing keys we have a lot of instances across the district where just based on wear and tear they're missing pieces parts the monitors either 
you can barely see them anymore the dimness and everything isn't working for a lot of the computers they either can't charge won't hold a charge will not boot up so we go through a whole diagnostic to say can we get a new battery is there any upgrades we need to do before we declare it as surplus um, and I know this is the first time since I've started that we've yep. done a technology one so it's probably a little bit larger than what we would like to do on an annual basis but with Julian and I sort of coming in and starting we wanted to do a full-blown inventory and analysis to make sure we had a really good handle on the age the condition and especially as we're looking to do some wholesale technology purchases in the upcoming months um, so these are all um, pretty much at their end of their useful life and majority of which are just not we've been trying to cobble it together and do the repairs we can as we go but these are all beyond that point that we're able to sort of it almost becomes throwing good, good money, money after, after bad, bad yeah if you will to try to keep so oftentimes it would cost us more to repair than it would be to replace yeah. Um, I, I just also think that I think this is excellent. The the impacts that we have when you're using um, technology that isn't working right is just it 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 is maddening. such a negative. It, it is maddening. <laughs> I, I at work I know I I am the desktop support people probably hate me. At the trailer their trailer is below me and about 50 feet away, and I just. Darn it, I, and the laptop isn't working right, and you can't get your job done, and something simple, <coughs> something enormous. You know, and that's just, that's me doing my job. I'm not, I don't have 30 students in front of me waiting for this laptop to do what it's supposed to do so we can get on with the, the exciting science class today. <laughs> and oftentimes we've been sort of redeploying the technology, so I know oftentimes people, like Carolyn has a loaner laptop that she's been trying to get replaced for a year. So we also do cycle it through where we'll take it, we'll sort of redeploy it while we're yeah. purchasing so, new ones. So thanks for doing a um, really thorough inventory and get us sort of back on a better cycle, hopefully. Yes. What's the replacement cost for all this? Um, that I would have to look at Julian's schedule so we have um, his I don't have it on me I can get it we have sort of the eight to ten year replenishment yeah, so we're at, we're it's around like an eight, eight year, year right now so is everything on here expired under our own standard of yes Oh, yes. Years? These are all past. Yeah, this is all past. Eight, eight year. Or it's an item where it's just it's not working anymore. Keyboards are missing. If someone wants to know the replacement cost, where could they get that? Um I it would really depend on what each one of these are. I'd have to look at what just the aggregate two hundred K, one hundred K, fifty K. Yeah, I don't I, I don't not, think I don't we can give you a, yeah. I don't a have cost with it. Because it, it's it's it goes beyond this because we're gonna be spending, you know, funds that both out of this year's budget and next year's budget um, to replace our oldest computers. What I would also slightly caution is these are also items that may have already been replaced, so we would have purchased them. We just have, so, I take this example, if Carolyn had received hers and this was deemed no longer usable, I would have already purchased her one. These are just items that we've gone through all of the buildings to say, mm -hmm. we have to start getting the this stuff out of the building so these are items that majority of which have probably already been replaced and over between last year and this and year. I think as Gail said I mean this this has probably been about two years worth of stuff because we have not the school committee has not done this Technology in over two years and mm -hmm. so this is this is uh, equipment that's been accumulating mm -hmm. So we can't really, you can't look at it as if these, all of these types of items are being purchased they tomorrow. Have been They've replaced. already they been, could have been replaced, replaced over time. Right. And also we have, what you're working on and Julian's working on is saying, yep. get us on a cycle that puts us at every five years, right? Correct. Instead yes. of That's the goal. Eight years. So like the replacement is just where we're going to be with, as he starts chipping away at that yep. eight and seven instead of eight Correct. to 12 year old or eight to 10 right. year old so a lot of these would be as 
because what I also don't want to have the impression is that people are sitting without right. the technology. Yeah, so we have been the replacing yeah. these as we go. <coughs> so a lot of them, the cost has already been incurred over last year and this year. Is there, yeah. is there a cost associated with disposal of these things? Yeah. Yes. Well, that was my question. Too. Well, one, one point I wanted to make also is we might not necessarily, if we put 30 laptops out of commission, we might not be getting 30 brand new laptops in commission. I mean, because technology is changing and we might go to portables or other mm -hmm. things. So it isn't a, necessarily a one-to-one -one with eight-year-old technology. So, but as far as the, what is the um, plan for how we get rid of it? Like, do we get rid of it in an environmentally friendly way? Do we, we work with the vendors. Work? Oftentimes the vendors will come and take them or there are agencies that will come and get them without a cost. Do we so, work with the town on that at all? Or is there a climate advisory thing? It's just no. us, so. It's just us. It's just yeah. us. We're not throwing them in the recycling. Yeah, well, um, but we work with a service. Yes, we do. Yeah, either a salvage yeah. company or something yes. else. Julian and I will work very closely to make sure that, but there, it's pretty common that districts do this. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Obviously, uh, aligned with that, Julian's doing this, we're doing it with a service that drives are scrubbed. There. Yes, that would we would do that ourselves as well before yeah, anything do. goes yeah, anywhere. They would. The weeds. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I'm, it's a lot of equipment and I want to make sure and we're And the goal would be going forward that this is done on a much mm -hmm. more frequent right, it will be that basis. Way. It would be mm -hmm. less. It's just I felt we were at the point that we needed to from a space and Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yes. Where is it now? <laughs> it is um, divided <laughs> amongst... Closets and stuff, um, or are people actually using this stuff? No, people like are not stuff. using it. I, I don't want to say if you go look upstairs outside Yeah, there may be some upstairs in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to go into the basement at a couple of the elementary schools. Yeah. It is... It's it, being treated as old and, and it is being it's like yes. quarantine it's, it's not like we're, we're it's beyond we're use no we're these using are, taxpayer money you can't to use no. it's a perfectly good laptop no these are shine. all actually right. where this started when we were doing a lot of the walkthroughs okay. of the buildings it became yes boy that's a lot of information in so it's all past eight years all it is past all past eight it is all available criteria for yes IT. we have gone through Thanks. um so julian and i actually went through all of the buildings all of the schools to make sure we could see them in, in looking at the material it was but they're all in but now that's also part of it is we've done such a good job of removing it that we're we have no more capacity to keep storing it mm -hmm. all right ready to vote on the motion yes all those in favor five zero thank you <clears throat> could we um uh, for Jen's benefit, do the barrel search. Sure. Okay. Now. Yeah. So, um, a few weeks ago, uh, Heather Leonard, the principal of Barrows, approached me and uh, inquired uh, if there was a possibility that she could be considered for the STEM coordinator position. <coughs> uh, one of the things that Heather is very passionate about is science, mathematics, technology, engineering, um, and has served in those capacities as the lead principal for those curriculum areas in our district. Um, she also has a very strong background in, in those areas, and I, I put that in the memo. Um, having a strong background in environmental science and has also been a math and science teacher uh, when she was in Gloucester. So we had we had a lot of discussion about it um, and you know agreed that you know this is something that she's very passionate about this is something that she approached me with and um, so we last week appointed her as the new K-6 STEM coordinator uh, we're very excited. I mean, this is a, a new position that came about through the through the override, and this with the humanities coordinator, which we uh, just posted, or we will be posting, we'll be, we'll be posting tomorrow. Um, we're going to be critical for our K to six alignment of our curriculum in these areas. 
and to help support our teachers and our building principals at the elementary and, and middle school. What that does, though, is it creates an opening at Barrows for principal. Um, so since we're getting really good at this this year, uh, we're going to be doing a search, principal search. Um, I do believe that, and we've already started getting applications. We, I think we're up to six or seven applications and we posted it Friday afternoon. I do believe we will get um, a, a strong pool um, of candidates for this position. Um, we do tend to get deeper pools for elementary openings in the past that we have. A couple of years ago, I don't know if you recall, we actually did a search just about this same time for Killam. And we did hire Sarah Levesque as the Killam principal about the last day of school, if I recall. So the timeline is um, very consistent to what we did a couple of years ago for, for Killam. <coughs> so you can see that like our other search processes, um, we will be putting a screening committee together consisting of administrators, teachers, usually the building secretary is part of that, and parents. Um, that is going out tomorrow, I believe, or today. It went out today. Thank you. It went out today uh, asking both staff and community <coughs> if, if they would be interested. So it was posted on Friday. Um, you're reviewing the process today. <coughs> We've sent out a survey uh, getting feedback on the qualities they want to see in the next principal. Um, once the screening committee is chosen, we will be meeting with them <coughs> and to design questions. Um, deadline for application is May 25th. Uh, we'll be doing the first round on May 31st. And then very similar to the way we've done other principal searches, um, we will then go through a vetting process to uh, for finalists, which will continue with open microphone nights, possibly site visits, and then um, an appointment, uh, the week, hopefully the week of June 11th. That's, that's the goal. Um, so that, that's the plan. Um, again, I am optimistic that we will get a strong pool and uh, we'll be able to have a principal on board. I, it's uncertain if a person could start on July 1, given the, the lateness of the, of the search, and that's something uh, we'll be working with. Obviously, with Heather staying in the district, um, the transition will be smoother. Um, and Mrs. Leonard will also be mentoring this person next year. I think it's also important to note that uh, Ms. Ms. Leonard's compensation will be different too in this position. Uh, it will yes. be less than what she's making, yes. This is, yep. I, I, timeline looks okay from, from my perspective. I just wanted to also suggest that it's nice to have someone in this position from within the district because it's, challenging I think or at least from the outside to have seven I think it's seven grades and seven buildings mm -hmm. is that right you talking about the coordinator yeah oh I'm yeah, sorry the, the yes position she's yes. going to so yeah. so yes. I, I think continuing the like, <coughs> partnership with with our administration is is just this is a tremendous asset and, and really we're very grateful for her willingness to to work with you in the, in the hiring process and and in the hiring pro but for the principal replacement we're talking about here I'm okay with the schedule uh, and for the for the other open position and and I just want to highlight also these two positions the coordinator positions were override correct, correct. Yes. that is correct this is from the taxpayer so thank you to the taxpayers as well. thank you <laughs> excellent is there a motion um, did I do a motion? Move to approve the Barrow's principal search timeline and process. Second. 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 All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you. Yeah. So, why don't we do, do the do this? evaluation and okay. then we'll the foundation at the end. Sure. <coughs> so um, I know that I've sent an awful lot to the committee the last 24 hours. Um, and what I want to do this evening 
is to talk a little bit about the evaluation process. So essentially the process begins, um, the summative process begins tonight. Um, the process has been going on all year. Um, but the uh, summative piece begins tonight. Um, before I begin that, I just want to give a little history. So the state evaluation process has been in place since uh, 2011, 2012. Um, in 2011, I was one of a handful of superintendents who uh, piloted the new quote unquote at the time process, which is the process that has continued since then that you see today and is done by all superintendents in the Commonwealth. Um, as part of that process, it's a five step cycle. Um, I come to you at the beginning with goals, district improvement plan goals, and um, my own, my own uh, personal goals. <coughs> Uh, throughout the year, I'm implementing those goals once you approve those goals. And then um, throughout the year also, evidence is being gathered uh, as part of that. I will say that every educator in our district goes through the same process. The one difference between my process as a superintendent and everyone else's is uh, under Massachusetts General Law, the superintendent is public. Uh, no other positions evaluation is public. Um, so that, that you as a school committee obviously have a daunting task and that you have to go through mounds of evidence and data and um, then, then complete the, uh, the information. <clears throat> so in the, in the memo that was outlined with the process, and this is not any different from what has happened in previous years. <clears throat> so the chair or designee, um, so I, sh I should back up. So this evening is the beginning of the process where I will be doing a presentation for the committee um, on the information. The drop box of all of the information um, you have at your availability. And what I've done this year, if you haven't looked at it yet, is I've separated it by the four standards that are in the evaluation. So there are folders that have the four stand uh, evidence for each of the four standards. And in addition to that, the focus areas of the goal um, and the, uh, my student learning goal. The pro I'm sorry, the professional practice goal. The student learning goal is the same as the district improvement plan goal with the focus areas. So rather than have redundancy, that's all the same. There will be duplication of evidence in different folders, so you may see evidence more than once. It was to be easier for you as a school committee member, um, so you wouldn't have to try to go bouncing back and forth. It doesn't mean that evidence you can't use for one for another. Um, you can only make so many connections, but I think you'll get the picture when you go, go through everything. So during um, the next couple of weeks, you'll be reviewing the evidence um, and any other information that you have. Um, at your disposal, and you will be um, completing the rubric, I'm sorry, the form that is marked in here, superintendent evaluation. I've given this to you in a Word document. I sent it to you today by email. Um, it's also in the folder called forms that are to be used for the evaluation process. So the Word document is in there that you can complete. Um, you will notice that before that in your packet, there is a very lengthy rubric. The rubric aligns to the form that you will be filling out. So when you go to, if you go to the page that says Reading Public Schools Superintendent Evaluation, we didn't number these, but, and then you flip it over, you will see this. Okay, so you will see at the top four standards. Standard one, instructional leadership. Standard two, management and operations. Standard three, family and community engagement. Standard four, professional culture. All administrators in the district have these four standards. Teachers have a different four standards. Um, it looks a little bit different. Standards one and two are different for teachers. 
Um, but all administrators have these four standards. Underneath each standard, you see what are called indicators. So in standard one, there's an indicator called curriculum indicator, instruction indicator, assessment indicator, so on. Under each indicator, there are called elements. The elements are uh, those numbers that you see. So A1 is standards-based unit design. That's an element. Standard two is lesson development support. So the rubric describes what it looks like for each of the four levels. So for example, standard one, A, one, standards-based unit design, you'll see there are four levels, unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, and exemplary. It describes what that looks like. This document you do not need to submit. This is more of a working document for you. Then you take this information and you transpose it to the, the other document, um, which is the uh, second document in the form. That's also in a, both of these are in as Word documents in your folder. So if we now flip to that document, which is called the summative evaluation document, I've never liked how the state has set this up because it's kind of backwards, but. Yeah. Um, so you'll see that there are, the first, the first one is to assess the progress towards goals. There are three categories, the professional practice goal. I'm gonna describe all this this evening. The student learning goal, the district improvement plan goals, okay? You would, you would give a rating of one of those five ranging from did not meet to exceed it. Then you have the indicators. So you have the four standards. You would give a rating, an overall rating for each standard of unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary. Where do you get this information? You go back to the rubric. You take a look at the rubric for that standard and what you've completed. That's step two. When you go to step three, step three is an overall rating. So essentially you take these four standards and you come up with an overall rating based on the four standards. Okay, which is Anyone confused so far? No, but <laughs> the, the point about that it's sort of backwards is you have to use, you use the detail pages below right. as you do right. the evaluation and you're using the rubric um, as you look at the evidence. So you're looking at all the evidence, you're using the rubric and we fill out, you basically start like um, page, page five is um, instructional leadership standard and you, uh, you do that detail piece first and it rolls up. Right, it rolls up. Right. Step four is the comments. <coughs> so this is where you put your narrative comments. Yep. Um, yeah. The, oh, I'm sorry. The next. Nick had a question. Yes. I just, sorry to interrupt. The one thing I wanted to point out that I found helpful when I first went through this process, everything up to where you just got to in the packet, so everything up to where you specify goals, I think you were just starting there on page three of the superintendent evaluation. So the form is from the state. I'm just going to point out where there's standardization and then where there's customization. Right? Yep. So everything in that you just went through from, sorry, I have to flip pages as well here. The superintendent evaluation of Reading Public Schools, that, that first document, the rubrics, the standards, directly from the state, every school district in Massachusetts. Yeah, the only difference is I've put running public schools on it. Right, right, yeah. but there's no, this is not our school committee, this is this is what the state has. And, and what I found really helpful to point out these these um, descriptions of each of the standards that you pointed to in that chart, so you, I think you called it a working document, which it, it is, for each of the categories, exemplary, proficient, et cetera, also from the state, so we're all working from the same standard. Correct. This school committee, any school committee, um, we're all working from the exact same uh, standard. There's also a link to this and a whole bunch of other things. Maybe we could put in the packet. I, I shared it by email. I think we did. We, we did. If it is in the packet, that's so that, that's all of the educator evaluation for every educator 
But for people that have questions about how the right. process works, you're right, it's, it's over-inclusive for this discussion because it includes All staff outside of scope, right. right, so principals, et cetera. But it does have a nice specific packet on just the superintendent's evaluation, which as a primer, as someone when I was starting last year, thought was really helpful. So I'm sorry to interrupt, I just, we, we were kind of crossing a, a, a line there between the, the standardized part of the um, review process and the customized part now, and so mm -hmm. we're moving into that. Thanks. So the next page, which is the goals, so this links back up to this is above. Customized. So what I've done is I filled in the goals for you, so you wouldn't have to try to figure out. So these are the goals that you approved. The the first one, um, the professional practice page. goal. Page, page three. three. The professional practice goal and the student learning goal one and two. Those are my two goals. Mm -hmm. um, but you you will have a document in your um, packet. Um, yeah. So I just wanted, this is customized because John, because this every year vote. John has. These are the goals you approve. We voted. We voted. Yeah, you voted on this. this. This is yeah, a no, we've been process. talking about these okay. goals since the beginning no, 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 of no. the year. Right. They are the, the goals that were set. I'm just saying yeah. the process is standardized. It's just, this is, yeah. okay. Yeah, these, these are our school committee goals for the superintendent. Yeah. Yeah. And then what I've done in, in addition to, because we had the, the goal, but then we had the focus areas. So I have now also added for you the focus areas, which in all essence they are goals, so that if you want, you give a rating for those as well. So there are, um, those, those are listed, okay? <clears throat> Moving on to the next page. So now this is where it's broken down by standard. So under standard one, there are five indicators. So again, you get the information from your rubric, you transpose uh, the information from the rubric to here, and you do it by indicator. So under each, that was that first document that I showed you how the standard is broken down into, um, in standard one, it's broken down to five indicators. So this is standardized again? This yes, is this is all standardized. This is not. Um, then you would give an overall rating for standard one. And again, that's the same, this is the same rating you would put at the beginning of this document. Same with standard two. Standard two has five indicators. Standard three has four indicators. Standard four has six indicators. On the uh, focus areas, so there's data uh, in the... So what I did in the Dropbox is I created a folder for each focus area. Okay, good. So there's evidence for each focus area. <coughs> this is a lot of work. Um, so what is, what is public are these um, summatives. Um, eventually will be public, um, as well as your comments that you put on the summative. So between now and, I don't know what the date is that was in the memo, but between now and... I think it's June 19th. No, no oh, I'm, I'm talking about the... For the end. The first piece. June 18th is the end. Between now and May 21st. Between now and May 21st, which is our next school committee meeting, um, you're going to comp complete a draft copy of... Um, your individual report, and you're going to send it to chair. the chair or the designee and myself. During the time frame of May 22nd to June 4th, um, Linda will schedule individual meetings with um, each school committee member and myself to go through the draft <coughs> to answer any questions that you may have um, and to answer any questions that I may have. This is part of the growing process um, of the evaluation process. Then, as a school committee member, based on those conversations, you can decide you like it the way it is, um, or you can edit it and send it, send it back to the designee and the superintendent. Once you send it back a second time, um, it's now your final copy. The designee then takes that information and is going to be a total of seven documents. So the first six are your individual reports. 
The seventh document, which is the front document, will be a compilation um, of the ratings and the summary. It'll be a summary of your comments. So not every comment will be on there, but a summary of the common themes. Um, then on June 18th, well, it'll be put in the packet, and then on June 18th, at your <coughs> June 18th meeting, you'll discuss and vote on the evaluation. So one thing that's important in the timeline, it has, like you said, June 15th is when the school committee chair will um, present the draft, the summative. The final, the final, yeah. And that, and that's so that we can get it in the packet and right. make and it public. So it's just then on the 18th for the packet, the school committee will receive that summative evaluation at the same time as the packet yes. is released. So no school committee member receives the, the school committee members receive the summative um, final um, evaluation at the same time as the packet is released for that meeting. So I want to uh, I'll come to the, to the, the next thing is the, uh, who does the summative. Yeah, that's, that's your call. So uh, <laughs> I want to just read this again. I wanted to talk to Colby Brunt, yep. uh, our labor, our <coughs> council about this legal alert and find out how cri I mean, how critical it is for us to assign someone other than a mm -hmm. committee member. To, so I'm not going to yeah. What we've tonight. learned a little bit more from MASC, and that's just one source. And I agree that you should yeah. talk to Attorney Brunt. Is that the issue in the case the about the town manager from another community, not not ours, in the way that that evaluation was done, is that members received it before the community did, yeah. received the um, evaluation, which would be a violation of open meeting law. Yeah, I mean it's clearly we've never done that. Yeah, we we've, we've no, you've always, always you've always right done it way. that yeah. everyone gets yeah. it at the same time. Yeah, uh, but I just want to talk to her just to. We don't go we, down the wrong road. We, we don't see, in my experience, we don't see each other's evaluations to the public. <coughs> right, we don't right. see each other's or the final. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Only that one designee is. Correct. And that, it has, yeah, it has no been way. that way since the very, very beginning of this process. I think that's, it's important just to, because yeah. we sure. don't, it's yeah. not, it's part of our, we're not paying in any extra. To right. So what I'd like to do now, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You, no, you I was like going to ask. So it's, it's part of the question you're asking is whether one of us can do the correlation of the. Yeah. That's yeah. Or, or do we, we need have, to have an, uh, an outside person. Outside. Which yeah. we're hoping. Yeah, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, um, and you, you received this as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through and update. I will, there are some slides that will look familiar to you that I won't spend a lot of time on um, because you've seen them before and you, you can look through them at your leisure. Uh, there are other things that I do want to emphasize and highlight based on the district improvement plan. And really this is a final update for the year of where we are at in two areas, the district improvement plan and then my goals. Um, so really these are the areas we're going to look at. Um, and then uh, obviously answer any questions. I, if I could get through the different sections and then open it up at the end of a section for questions, that way we can move through this. Yeah. Um, Is that your stage? It's on under your book, Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Lynn, do you have an extra one of these? Oh, she can, you can, you can. Thank you. Um, so the process that we have used in developing the district improvement plan has been the DESI, again, a consistent model that is being used by a lot of school districts in the state. It's called the Planning for Success process. Um, Obviously, when we're going through this process, I meet with the Administrative Council to develop the goals that we're going to do for the year, the action plans, uh, the action steps. Uh, we are completing the second of a three-year district improvement plan. Um, we refine the goals each year, and then we review our progress throughout the year. And in March, if you remember, the uh, 
the district leadership team presented to you an update on those goals. And that is part of the five step process. Um, so here are the five, the five, uh, the main goal is in the middle, addressing the academic, social, emotional, behavioral health needs. Um, there are the focus areas, which is closing the achievement gap, social, emotional learning, literacy, and mathematical practices. So here's the district goal for the next, over the next three years, um, concluding at the end of the 18-19 school year, uh, which you just said. And here are the five action areas, which I, I just um, explained to you. The, uh, the fifth one being uh, effective and proactive to a communication. So these are slides you've already seen from March, so I'm gonna quickly go through them. Um, these are the projects that we're prioritizing this year. As you know, at the elementary level, it's writing. Um, we are also in the second year of our science curriculum implementation, which focuses this year um, in partly in uh, middle school, but mostly in high school. Also implementing advisory at the middle school, so this is focus area D. Um, this was an area that middle schools I presented to you in March about. Uh, the level consolidation, which is happening at middle school in math, um, in at different courses at the high school, which is gonna be a phase in process. Um, reviewing of the special education language-based programs, which is, which is going on, and the school climate survey, which is beginning to happen this month and will conclude by the end of the school year. All of these professional development activities, and again, I, not, we, these are things we talked about already in March, so I'll let you read them more at your leisure. Um, and they include the Agile Learning Institute, which was with our district leadership team, Facing History in Ourselves, which was the middle school staff. Um, there was a lot of elementary math work being done with Mahesh Sharma the, um, and other, other um, consultants. The Anti-Defamation League came in uh, at the middle school and high school. Um, QBS training, which is our behavior safety training, which is done with staff K-12, actually pre-K-12. Um, there's a, been a lot of work in writing this year at the elementary level, um, grades one to three and four to five. Uh, we've had what's called level literacy intervention training, again, focusing on literacy. There's been a strong focus on literacy at the elementary this year. You will see that will continue into next year. Um, at the preschool level, doing uh, picture exchange communication. You saw a presentation uh, in March um, by Kelly Bostrick uh, with this. Uh, also, uh, through our Reading Education Foundation, getting some, some, folk, some funding through Linda Mood Bell training. Um, NPEN, which was on the election day, uh, where we had several staff going to various schools um, and getting training in a variety of areas. We also had a STEM Institute here um, in, I can't remember, November, I think. Uh, we've had a lot of math training also at, at the elementary level, both pre-K K and K to two. Um, We've also had a lot of work with our PE health teachers. Um, I believe tonight is the workshop, the puberty workshop. I think that's tonight. So that, um, and for the, for the elementary parents, because grade five, we're gonna be doing the puberty unit, um, I think it's next week, so, or maybe it's in June, early June. Um, and that is the result of the, the work that uh, they've been doing with Dr. Bennis. Um, we've also been doing keys to, keys to literacy work at RMHS, and this is part of the training for the level consolidation. Um, engaging schools also has been training at the high school level, um, also as part of the level consolidation. So that's all the professional development that's been going on to link and connect to the district improvement plan goals for this year. So you remember these colors from last year. There are three colors. Um, if the benchmark is complete, it's green. If it's in progress, um, it's yellow. And if it's planned and hasn't started yet, it's blue or it's white, depending on um, the color for the, the um, document. So what I wanted, last year I was only able to give you one year. So now I'm able to give you two years to see where we've done on the 
on the goal on the action steps so you can see in closing the achievement gap um, We've made some significant progress in our action steps, going from five to 15 complete. Um, and you can see that now none are planned. And so we are in implementation at some stage in all areas of this. So some of the highlights include using data. There's been a significant amount of data being used to inform the practices of each school. Our schools now have regularly scheduled data meetings where staff are talking about the data that is specific to the areas that they are focusing on. You saw at the Josh Eaton presentation that they're focusing on literacy and attendance. Um, and that they're focused on that data at their data meetings. Um, our schools are now using the intervention blocks to help students that are struggling or maybe at risk. And there are discussions about the levels and the sequences that are going on. So here's an example. It's tough to see, and I apologize, but you do have the document. So here's some things, you know, math assessments. These are benchmark assessments, and I want to caution the committee that benchmark assessments are not common assessments. We use this as a tool to identify where students need uh, support or intervention. Um, so these are more individual assessments, but it's helpful you to see that <clears throat> We are seeing an increase in students that are reaching the benchmark between 16, 17, and um, uh, 17, 18 for our, our uh, not high needs, but and also high needs students. Um, in, in kindergarten, um, you can also see it in grade one. In grade two, this is the first year we've done these, the benchmarks for the math assessment. So you can see that's why 16, 17, um, there was no data provided. In terms of student accessing to higher level classes, these are all data points that are in the district improvement plan, so I'm giving you examples. Um, you can see that um, where you are seeing the collapse of levels is where you see the difference in 16-17 to 17-18. So in English, our college preparatory classes are pretty much now um, non-existent. Um, in math, we are seeing a slight decrease. Um, in science, we are starting to phase that out. I believe grade nine right now uh, is where we're doing our collapsing. And also you see in social studies, history, um, we've done that as well with our high need students. So that's where you're seeing the most significant change is with our high need students because traditionally our high need students has been in that college preparatory level. So by collapsing the levels, those students are now in the strong college prep or in some cases, um, the honors level. SAT mean scores, this is actually a document, a slide that you saw when Lynna Williams did her presentation, um, the 2018 scores, which is the current uh, junior senior group. Um, and you can see that uh, you know we have we have made strides in progress, um, both higher than the state average, but also from previous year. And also remember that the SAT has changed right. its test in the last two years and, and is more rigorous. Our advanced placement participation has also increased. And you can see here by the, the chart as the line is going up, we were recognized again this year as an AP honor roll school. Um, in order to do that, you have to show increased participation in AP courses, taking the AP exams. Um, so Reading did um, excel in that. And now with the new staffing additions for next year, we are going to be offering more AP courses. Um, in, particularly in the social sciences where we do not have a lot of AP offerings right now. We're going to be sending some teachers to training this summer um, for, uh, for some of the AP history offerings that we're going to be doing next year that we have not done in the past. <clears throat> we've also received more recognition as we've gone along. I'm sorry. I said a quick on yeah. <coughs> Back to the SAT. What about uh, the other F? ACT. ACT. Do we have that data too? I think Lynn have presented She it did present night. it. I'm not showing you all the data I have. Um, I only was trying to highlight some areas. I did, I, Lynna did present the ACT data in the fall. Okay. Um, I think we were stayed pretty 
similar to last year, if I recall in the ACT. Our participation numbers are going up. Right. More students are taking the ACT. More colleges are looking, more colleges are looking at it over the SAT. But I believe our scores stayed pretty similar to last year. Uh, so in our advanced placement recognition, you can see also that uh, our AP scholar numbers are going up. Scholars with honors stayed the same. Um, scholars with distinction, but that's because our scholar numbers have increased as well. So moving on to uh, action plan B. That was all for action plan A. I wanted to show you some data on that. So literacy, um, you can see that in terms of action steps, we have uh, made some uh, improvements going from four to eight would complete, um, which means you're gonna have less in process. Our plan to stayed essentially the same. So as I mentioned earlier, some of the highlights, writer's workshop now be, being implemented in grades K through five, that will continue to be a focus, but there was a significant amount of training this year. Um, more emphasis being placed on calibration of common benchmarks, such as the Founders and Purnell. Um, you're going to see, as we go along in, into next year, a greater focus on reading comprehension. Uh, we're now going to be obviously having some more coaching support, uh, but we also have teacher leaders that have been attending the um, teacher uh, Columbia Teacher's, Teacher's College. College. Thank you. I was going to say John Hopkins. It's not John Hopkins. Um, attending that and getting more training in literacy, and they're going to come back now as teacher leader coaches to help support other teachers in the district. Um, you've seen this also, these are our MCAS scores. Remember that the MCAS cha test had changed this year. Um, so really what we're showing you is compared to the state average, and you can see that, you know, compared to the state we are um, meeting, ex meeting or exceeding expectations is, is, is higher um, than, the, than the state. Also in grade eight, we also see the same thing. Remember though in grade 10, um, that is still the old MCAS. This will change next year when it also goes online for the first time um, at the high school level. And you can see that over the years, Reading has done um, you know, very well in this area with 95% of our students this year reaching advanced proficient. Moving on to action plan C, which is the math. Um, you could see that we have made some progress with the action steps going from five to nine with complete. Um, the plan has gone down from 15 to 11 and the in process has stayed essentially the same. So some of the highlights, again, focusing on K to two, because um, we want to make sure we build that foundation. Uh, we've had a lot of training happening with the AMC assessments, which you did see earlier in an earlier slide, uh, being administered at K to two. The whole purpose of that is to develop that consistency across the five elementary schools. Um, so now all the elementary teachers are getting trained in this. That training will continue into next year. Uh, you were also seeing we're having professional development and differentiated instruction um, at both the middle and high school. We are seeing a number of students accessing higher level courses at its highest levels. I'm going to show some data on that. And then the new secondary math sequences are being implemented for next year. John, what uh, level of involvement will the new curriculum coordinators do with any changes to this stuff? Uh, so the curriculum coordinators will be focused on K to six, right. but they will be working very closely with our middle school staff and our department heads to make sure we have alignment K to 12 or pre-K to 12. So they won't come back and say, you know, we should be doing, like I'm looking at the highlights for action plan B, do something different or? No, uh, no, it'll be consistent to the direction we're going. So for example, having now Heather in that role, she has been a part of the AMC right. assessment training. In fact, was the one that coordinated the April 13th training with our elementary staff. Um, so she is, you know, she's on board with what we're doing. Obviously, when we're hiring a literacy humanities coordinator, the philosophy uh, in in the background in reader and writer's workshop is going to be critical in who we hire for that position because that's the direction we're going at the elementary. <coughs> 
Um, so you've seen this also. Uh, this was a March presentation um, in terms of the, the sequence. So right now in grade seven, remember we've gone from three to two next year. Those students will then go into grade eight, which will go from three to two, and then that will continue in the sequence that you see there. Um, this presentation was made to you in March. The data is showing um, <coughs> in grade seven, because that level now has been collapsed, you see an increased participation in our Math 7 enrichment class, uh, going from 51% to 77%. Our Math 7 8 has essentially stayed consistent. Math 8, um, we will see, next year you will see a difference in enrollment because we'll go from three levels to two levels. Um, what this shows um, is that the percentage of students that are now in AP Calculus, and you can see over the years how that has now increased to 10% of our students. Um, so the total calculus enrollment, remember that our senior class this year is a smaller class, so the, the number of kids is going to be smaller. But we have 10% of our students um, in AP Calculus for the 2017-18 school year, which as you can see is, is these three years have been our highest. Mm -hmm. Moving on to Action Plan D, <coughs> which is social-emotional learning. Um, again, we've made significant progress in our action steps, going from 8 to 14, incomplete. Um, our obviously in process then goes down and plan goes down because more of those are complete. So some of our highlights, I already talked about the grade three to five health education piece. Um, we are now implementing the SBIRT process in grades nine and 11. Remember that last year we did it in nine, this year we moved it to 11. So that has been happening in the spring with grade 11. Grade nine was completed in the fall and that's being done by Lynn Dunn um, and our, our CASA staff um, have been providing that support as well for those students that have been identified. Uh, we now have the building leadership teams implemented at all the schools. Um, those uh, two members from each building leadership team are part of a district-wide data team meeting, uh, which we have once a month, um, a quarterly, I'm sorry, quarterly, which is coordinated by Courtney Fogarty. Um, in fact, we're meeting tomorrow. Um, to discuss progress and the way Courtney has set it up is that each school is focusing on the areas that they need to based on the data that we are collecting. So the data in the district improvement plan, those data points um, is where we'll be, each school will be focusing their energy and resources for next year. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we are getting coaching support provided. Um, we do have a behavioral coach that is uh, mostly funded out of the, the school transformation grant that has been providing that support to all of our buildings. Um, and then we're seeing a change in the office discipline referrals, which is one of the benchmarks um, uh, that is part of the grant reporting to the federal government. So here's the major discipline office referrals, and there's a you can see that in some cases they're going down or staying pretty consistent. The one area I want to point out is the high school. And so I did inquire as to why this was happening. So a couple of changes. One is that you now have consistency um, in the reporting for the last two years, 2016-17 and this year. Uh, these are done by the assistant principals. And we've had the same assistant principals for the last two years, so this consistency in reporting. The second reason is this this year, they decided as part of the office discipline referral process is to, um, you would receive office discipline referrals if you receive so many tardies. So tardies are now included as part of office discipline referrals. And I, I think it's four per semester. I'm not sure. It's either four per quarter or four per semester. I can't remember. But that is why you see the increase um, from 16, 17 to 17, 18. Primarily that increase is due to tardies are now being recorded as part of office discipline referrals. Can we get that nailed down as to how much? Because that's a huge jump. Yeah. It's, it's mostly because of tardies. So it may be flat or less after you take out the tardies? I mean... Yeah, it would be nice to know well, how many of them were the tardies. Yeah, we can, we can definitely, we can definitely do that. Yeah. 
continuum. Oh, yes. Um, oh, sorry, I guess I was... The, okay, that, that was the only one that really jumps out. Yeah, that's the one that jumps out. The, um, the other thing I want to... So, so suspensions is also data that we collect. And I think you can see also that consistently either we're staying the same or going down in our um, suspensions. And you can see that none are resulting in expulsions. These are incidents, by the way, not students. So you could have one student that would have several incidents. So I, I want to clarify that. So that's not necessarily the number of students. It's incidents, it's not number of days, it's number of incidents. It's number of incidents, and it's not number of students. So you okay. could have a student that has five incidents. Right. So how long would a suspension be? It, it depends. Varies? It varies, depending on what it is. Does, does that include, like, in school, in school suspensions? Yes, it does. And out? So we have to record in school as a suspension. It could be a one-day in-school suspension or a multi-day out-of-school. I'm just writing something that you requested. Some of these slides you've seen before, so this is the YRBS piece, and we've done obviously a lot of work with our CASA and with our health classes um, on um, the social emotional piece. So you've seen these slides before in terms of negative stressors and sources of stress. And I think what's important also at the middle school, but I think what's important is all of the supports we have available to our students to help them with those stress levels. So that's the, uh, the right half of the slide. Um, you know, ranging from the interface, which is funded by our CASA, <coughs> to um, some of the other supports that we have um, at the different levels. So I wanted to make sure that was captured. The other thing is also our substance use. And you can see that uh, for the main areas of alcohol, marijuana, binge drinking, um, we do con continue to see downward trends. Obviously, the one that we're concerned about is the e-vapor, because that is going up. That's not just a Reading. Every superintendent I talk to, this is a major concern um, in our, um, in the, in mostly in, a, in their high schools. Uh, connection is also something that we want to closely monitor, because that's linked to, if students feel like they have an adult that they can go to, um, that's important. So you can see that this data over the last several years has also been on the rise, both in school and in the community, which shows the strength of um, our, certainly the support our parents give our our, their children, our students, but also the type of community programs and involvement that our students have available to them in, just in the school and outside the school. Moving on <coughs> to action plan E, which is the communication piece. Again, you can see um, we have made some progress in the action steps going from four to five um, and reducing the number plan from three to one. Um, some of the highlights in this area, Parent University was our first uh, attempt, mm -hmm. which was very successful this year and continuing to do that next year. Uh, we have received grant funding from our CASA and we're hoping to receive grant funding from Reading Co-op. Um, we have a dynamic speaker that we would love to bring in and we're just waiting to hear about that funding to see if we can bring that person in. Um, I made the point this year, al along with the rest of um, the central office to attend different types of events. So uh, I made a point of making at least one PTO school council meeting in every school. Um, it was primarily before the budget process, but we did do some during the budget process as well. Um, myself, <coughs> uh, Gail, uh, had several office hours during the budget process. Carolyn has been instituting budget, uh, sorry, office hours and school visits. Um, you notice in our newsletter we we advertise those on the left hand side in the in the pathways newsletter, uh, and then the pride survey, which is going to be happening this month and next month, um, which will give us student data, community data, and um, teacher data. Here's just a kind of visual of the number of office. I'm sorry. Hey, Kevin, question. 
So when do we get the results from the Pride survey? Not, till, uh, not, not until late June, early July. Do we have results from last year's survey? We didn't do it last year. This is the baseline data we're going to do this year. Hmm. It's funded out of the school transformation grant. It was one of the goals this year. It was in my goals this year to do it. And we've been working also with the RTA on this too because um, they obviously would we're interested in the data as well. But we won't have the results in time to evaluate them as part of the process. No, you will not. Um, <coughs> this is kind of a visual that shows the office hours up to this point, all of the different office hours that we have had um, over the year. I've tried to do three a week. Um, most weeks I am successful doing that. Are those your office hours or a uh, those are those are primarily mine, although um, Mrs. Dowd attended several of those as part of the budget process. Carolyn has had several as well. Um, the other area in the district improvement plan is early evidence of change. So I also wanted to give you a summary of those. Um, so focus area A, uh, the number complete went from two to nine. Um, in literacy, it went from zero to five. Math stayed the same. ES, uh, SEL went from one to two, and communication stayed the same. You can see also what's changed. The number planned has gone down, which for the most part, most of the things that we are now doing are in process or complete, mm -hmm. which is really what should be happening in year two of a three-year plan. And, and I imagine this data is in the packet, like the supporting data that shows yeah. what measures you've used to, what evidence exists. I have for, given you yeah, everything no, that I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm able to, yes. I haven't been able to go through it all yet. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, everything, <laughs> yeah. everything I've... In one day? Yeah, in one day, yeah, yeah thanks. No, no, nor were you supposed to right. by tonight. Right. Thank you. <laughs> um, I provided you with as much evidence as I can. Certainly, if there's other things, I can try to get it for you, if, it's, if it exists. So that's the district improvement plan. Moving quickly to the goal. Um, so this is the student learning goal. This is a goal that is similar to both years. <coughs> and you can see that in terms of the action steps, uh, we moved from three to eight complete. Obviously, the number of in process have gone down and the number planned have gone down. We did add a couple of steps. You see that there's a total of seven in 16, 17, but nine in 17, 18 is because we added two steps. The other goal was a professional practice goal on visibility, so I've already shown you some of the data behind visibility um, in terms of attendance at different meetings. Um, so eight of these are complete, because I didn't have this goal in 16, 17, so you can't compare it. The individual goals not, are not necessarily multi-year goals. Mm -hmm. They can be an annual goal. Um, eight are complete, one in process, and three are planned. So just an overall analysis, we're certainly we're seeing progress in several areas. Um, the strategy this year of focusing on a few areas is a strategy we're going to continue next year. Uh, as you saw, and targeted strategy based on the data. Mm -hmm. So overall, our focus has been, depending on the school, on literacy, math, social, emotional learning, um, all tied into closing the achievement gap. That will continue for next year. Elementary, we will continue to focus primarily on literacy. Um, but I will, I'll get into more of that in a second. Um, so to do it all is not a good use of time and resources, because then you don't do any of it well. So the goal, again, is to, to, as much as possible, focus on a few areas. And then having the additional curriculum support is going to be huge in allowing us to do this work. I also wanted to show you how this is connected to the work you've been doing and hearing about. So what I've done, you've seen this before in previous years. I've added a column this year to show how it connects to the standard in the evaluation. So not only how it's connected to the focus area, but how it's connected to the standard. Um, 
So I hope you find this helpful. So I went through the entire school committee calendar for the year to show you how that's broken down. Yeah, this is helpful. Um, I think you can see that all the areas have been well represented. So now kind of shifting a little bit to, because um, this is my evaluation process. So the leadership opportunities that I've been involved with this year, um, this is my second year as chair, the second consecutive year as chair of the board, it just seemed to board of directors. Um, I'm also my second consecutive year of chair of the Mass PD committee. Um, those are two uh, positions that allow me to interact with other superintendents. Um, the chair of the Mass PD committee actually we plan the entire summer PD institute that is annually done by our association as well as the other monthly PD opportunities that MASS provides. I am a member of the Superintendent's Advisory Co Committee. In fact, we're meeting on Wednesday. We're meeting the commissioner, the new commissioner, um, and being able to have conversation with him. These have been very helpful because this committee gets a heads up on anything new coming down the road from the state before it goes out. And they get our feedback and input on how it should be communicated, is there any changes that should be made. So this is, this is certainly a committee and I, um, I represent our round table, uh, Merrimack Valley round table on that. And then I am the MASS representative on the Safe and Supportive Schools Commission to Governor Baker and the legislature. We're in our third year of that and we, each year we have provided an annual report to the legislature which has influenced the legislature to provide funding each year for safe and supportive schools in the budget, um, half a million dollars a year. So those are the leadership opportunities. Some other areas of note this year, this is more district. So we did transition one new administrator this year into the school district at Joshua Eaton. We did have the red event in the fall and all of the ensuing activities that have been going along with that. Uh, I mentioned Parent University, FY19 budgets, two budgets, um, and the, the time commitment and process that went through that. Uh, certainly the override ballot question that passed in April and that's a celebration. We have done four administrative searches or we will have done four administrative searches this year when it's all done uh, between the assistant superintendent to high school and Barrows. We are in the middle of collective bargaining for all five collective bargaining units. Um, Carolyn mentioned earlier this evening the extraordinary relief that was approved, and we are waiting to hear the outcome of the accelerated repair application that Gail and Joe Huggins submitted for the RMHS boiler. Um, in terms of profession, my own professional development, um, as I met, mentioned to you earlier, I was part of the Agile Learning Institute this year with the rest of the district leadership team. Carolyn and I and several Reading teachers just completed the same educational equity course, which was two months, about two months. Yeah, two months. Went by quick, but it was yeah. two months. Um, and really focused on uh, how do we provide educational e equitable opportunities for all students. We looked at all types of different students that exist in our classrooms. It culminated with projects. Um, I focused mine on kindergarten. Surprise, surprise. Um, and as part of the kindergarten presentation that we'll be do I'll be doing later this year, I will be using several of those slides um, in that presentation. Uh, certainly being a member of the Mass PD Committee is a very enriching form of professional development and participating in the Summer Institute in the different meetings. Um, I would have wanted to participate, I'll be honest, I would want to have participated in more professional development this year, but time just didn't allow it. So next year's planned activities. Uh, this is looking forward, consistent with the direction and the vision that we're going. Um, the implementation of literacy and reading at the elementary level. Um, the continued AMC math professional development and the K-2 science curriculum implementation. That's all happening at the elementary level. At the middle school, uh, differentiated instruction for mathematics, continued science and literacy implementation, because we are going to be in year three, 
and we are now going to be revving up for a plan change in social studies. A year from now, the 1920 school year, we will be having an eighth grade civics class as the change in standards um, shift. So we are going to be planning next year for that change. I'm sorry, 1819 school year. I say 1920. 1819 school year. They actually call it civics? No, 1920 school year. Yeah, civics, yes. At the middle school? Well, that's what the state frameworks is calling it. I was going to say it's a little old school. Yeah, but that's what they're calling it. Global something, right? At the high school, we'll be continuing with the differentiated instruction with engaging schools and focus on literacy. Uh, the NEASC process, which I talked a little bit about earlier. Um, we are going to be looking at late start for 1920 school year. So that committee will be, we, we are only one of three or four Middlesex League schools that will not be doing it next year. Um, so that's a restart. That's a restart. restart yes, that's a restart. Start. So, <laughs> maybe the late start. Uh -huh. You know, not, well, we can talk. I'm, okay. I don't want to digress, but that's going to put us in problem with games and stuff with, if we're one of. I don't think it will next year. It could be a problem in two years if we don't. So, it, right, that, it'll be great to have some new staff to help get yes. this all done. <laughs> um, there will be changes at the high school level for curriculum for social studies. So the, again, they'll be planning for that for next year. Year three of science curriculum will be primarily at the high school um, in grades 11 and 12. And K to 12, um, we do have one year remaining in the school transformation grant. The funding for that will be focused on restorative practices and collaborative problem solving, um, which really impacts focus area D, the social emotional um, learning. So we will be reporting out on all of these next year. So these are things to come. Part of here. Um, and that is pretty much everything. I have. Questions? I'm sorry. Joe? Any, any, I know we kept jumping in during, but does anyone have any other questions? Any, yes, Nick. So, a few questions on A, B, and C, actually. So, we can go back maybe to focus sure. area A. I will say, as you're going back and scroll through it, as we're getting there, I really like this chart that you put on page 27 of the handout, uh, where you went through all the school committee agendas and identified the relevant dates. Oh, OK. That's tremendously helpful for all involved. Good. So thank you. There's a lot of time to go through those. I tried to make this simple for you. It, I so. know you're looking at mounds of data. so That's, I that's very helpful. Um, so just a high level point about these slides, and I know they're intended to be high level, so I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of, of the words on the page here, because uh, we will get into the weeds in the um, materials you provide. In, in general, when we have situations that say, let's say, implement a process across, I'm just going to pick a number and say there are 50 classrooms that this, our goal is to implement a process in, or an assessment or whatever. Um, what, what I struggle with in, in these high level presentations is understanding which of three possible worlds we're in, in, in my mind. One is a world where one out of 50 were done and we say we're making progress. Another world is where 49 out of 50 are done and we could say the same thing. And then one is where a reasonable middle ground that you would expect given, let's say, our goal is to finish it by the end of next year and we're on track. Mm -hmm. And so I find it hard to, to understand which of those three worlds I'm in as I read through all of these slides and kind of go through the material. So, as you think about, and I know you supplement in response to questions from school committee members, one of my requests just in general, where we have that type of high level language that appears in a few different places here, to help us understand, is it one out of 50 and we gotta get 49 out of 50 done next year? Is it 49 out of 50 and we're almost done and, and we're ahead, kind of ahead of where we wanted to be or would expect to be? Or are we right about, right about where we would expect to be given that we're in year two of a three year set of goals? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, so, achievement gap, area A. What page are you on? Well, it has to be any page. I mean, just, okay. just a high level. Um, the, what is, if you can help, and I know this has been a goal that's been around for a couple, well, this year and last year, right? So, could, could you just remind everyone what the gap is that we're trying to 
address is, is and, and how did it arise? The gap really is ago. between the general population and our high needs subgroup. So it's it's high needs, and then yeah, primarily high needs, yes. And, and Which that, is just to define so people know. Please, um, special education students. I'm sorry, students with disabilities, oh, economically disadvantaged, and English language learners make up your high needs subgroup. That's our four, and we have those statistics in our packet, and it's yes. it's, it's easy to, for anyone to, to kind of identify the proportion of each of those, but not the individual numbers, but the proportion. Correct. Of each. So I'll be looking for evidence as I go through what you provide of how the information identifies progress in those students or that specific subpopulation of students. And it could be all together, it could be any portion of them that you think is relevant, but I'll be looking for baseline, we started here, whether it's a, any, anything you've presented here in area A, whether it's test scores, whether it's font finalis, uh, reading, I guess that's really later, but it, it really could be any of these. Um, math, it could be in math, English, it could be in science, it could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. So help us identify what the gap is, what, what motivated this committee to say there's a gap, set that as a goal, and then how are we making, pro how is that progress evidence and outcomes of what we measure with students? That would, that's my comment on A. Um, moving to B, which is literacy. And I'll, I'll just say in the evidence here, I, I'm not clear on the subpopulations that are the high need students in each of these slides. So if, if there is a breakdown, that'd be helpful to see in the, uh, in the materials. In B, for literacy, so the Fontes Pinellas benchmark, we had some discussion about that. Fontes Pinellas, I'm probably getting it wrong, but um, as we had a couple presentations this year from Joshua Eden, um, I'd be very interested in understanding what percent of students have been assessed of all students in, across the elementary schools and in, in the materials that you provide and, and how those students are doing and any limitations on our data that we may have because that, that may also be the case where we simply don't have uh, assessments that we can compare to each other for whatever reason. So help us understand the limits on our data and the progress we're making in, in the benchmarks we set in student assessment for literacy. And then it's the same question for math in area C for me. We have the AMC applying, assessing math concepts, concepts for the early grades, K to two. What do we have for three and later? Just down guess. Just down guess. That's all we got. Okay. So same question with the AMC assessment. Are we, how, how broadly are students being assessed? 80%, 90%, 50%, 20%, is, are there differences between elementary schools and, and how are they doing in those assessments? What's our plan to make sure that we have comparable and relevant data sets going forward where we do have gaps? I didn't know if you had any other questions. Not for me. Thank you. John, thank you for um, just the way that you, you know, presented this data, organized it, and all of the, the tremendous <coughs> work. Um, I do. Uh, can I make one other comment, um, which I think is important? And although I was the one presenting tonight, this presentation isn't all about me, nor should it be. Um, this is. The superintendent doesn't all doesn't do all this work, mm -hmm. right. and I would never take credit for all this work. I wouldn't take credit for a hundredth of this work. Um, there's always a very strong team that works very closely. So the team includes the principals, um, teachers, uh, director of student services, director of finance, um, other curriculum people. Uh, so this is not. Uh, team team chairs. So this is not, um, although this is the superintendent's evaluation, um, you know, it should be made clear that the superintendent did not do all this work. <laughs> okay, I just want to make that clear, that this is a, always a team effort. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's it? Okay. Good presentation. Oh, that's one thing. Okay. Um, not really a question, just a clarification. This slide that says early evidence of change process, mm -hmm. people that, uh, I'm assuming when I heard this, I want to make sure I'm correct. My understanding when you say number complete is that this refers to the 
if you go to the district improvement plan that we did, and you probably have it listed here in your calendar, there's at the back of the district improvement plan, there's a multi-page list of like a to-do list. No. That's not where these... No, so under each focus it, so area... I understood. So what, what, and under each focus area, it? there's early evidence of change chart, separate okay. from the action plan chart. So that's what I'm referring to. And where is that? That's in the district improvement plan under each focus area. So there's so, one for each focus area. So it's not the chart where you, you had in progress, completed, you had a whole bunch of specific action items. I can't remember what they're called, but it's in the back of the district improvement no, plan. No, it's not in the back. It's under each focus area. Oh, under each focus area. It's in our packet here? No, no, it's in the no, Dropbox. It's in, the in the Dropbox, okay. All right. So I didn't want to kill more trees. <laughs> so it's only presented in the materials in the Dropbox. It's not in the District Improvement Plan because I was... No, the not. District Improvement Plan is in, in the Dropbox. Dropbox. And this is in the District Improvement Plan? Yes. That's, yes. We're, I think we're invited Early to be in here. Yes. <laughs> so I, I mis I'm misdescribing what you're describing. So <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Sorry for the detail. Uh, um, yeah, and now we have the... Uh, Thank you, John. Uh, Thank chapter you. 70, yeah, so Foundation. Let me, um, let me read the motion. OK. Let me, um, I'm going to just make a motion, and I'll, I'll introduce it. But basically, we're making a motion um, for the school committee to approve a resolution calling for the full funding of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations. And I, I, that's a copied sheet. Um, Mrs. Engelson and I had a little bit of miscommunication on this, so um, we'll, but I, the handwritten sheet where it says, there, it ends with, therefore, be it resolved that the Writing School Committee calls on the Massachusetts Legislature and the Governor of Massachusetts to fully fund and adopt the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Committee in the immediate future. So our motion, it, the motion that I've made is for us to approve that revol resolution. And then it will be um, sent to our uh, representatives and senator. So um, I'll make the, again, the motion is that the school committee approve the resolution calling for the full funding of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations. Is there a second? So to discuss that, there's, if you, somewhere in the packet, um, after, oh, after this section, after the, uh, <coughs> The legal, uh, legal alert, legal alert um, was the letter introducing this just basically says that last year the MASC um, assembly passed a resolution resolution number six um, since that time 53 school committees have basically passed resolutions supporting the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission um, we provided some links um, this resolution that I have was provided by Dorothy Presser, our MS MASC field director, and it is basically the same resolution that a number of other school committees in our region have um, approved. Um, so this this actually first came to mind and Sherry's attention through Ben Tafoya, who works in the auditor's office, um, as well as the fact that it's been you know in our M MASC alerts. Um, and the recommendation of the Foundation Budget Review Committee cover health insurance, special education, English language learners, low income, um, funding of for low income students, um, data collection, preschool, you know, what, how the formula works um, with respect to inflation. Um, and basically this is, this part of what happened here was they haven't started moving on this because it's not, the change is not fully funded. And what school committees what are is. Right, 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 exactly. exactly. So it's like get on with it and get started implementing this and fund it to the extent you can, you know, make some decisions with the funding that you have and start doing this. So um, Ben actually asked, Ben actually asked, um, um, it was a, he caught Sherry and I and um, Nero's and, uh, you know, said, asked if we would consider this and, and join other committees. Um, in supporting this. So that's how it got here. That's how come we got this on the table to hold on. I, I could ask a question. So, uh, Sup Superintendent Doherty, you know so much about this. So, one question I have um, under the recommendations, if you happen to know, where uh, it talks about recalculating the special education costs. And the second bullet point under it says, increase the out of district special education cost rate to capture the full cost before the circuit breaker is triggered. Does that 
bring in the transportation. Do you know Mrs. Wilson? I don't think that's that that no. So that does that gap still exist? It's not part of the um, Chapter 70. I know there's been a lot of discussion about transportation. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if that's what that bullet means, but yeah. I know when the commission was commissioned that mm -hmm. that was um, a big topic. It certainly was a big topic of discussion on the day in the Hill, so I, I was surprised that it wasn't spelled out more explicitly in here. And I didn't know if it was in... One of the things that they also talk about a lot is regional transportation yes, is not definitely. fully funded, right. which is separate from special and education. Which doesn't affect us. No, it does not. Yeah. Right. I think that um, there was sort of a final statement from the um, Foundation Budget Review, which I thought was sort of a good statement that... You know, the good work in Ed Reform started in 1993. 92. Right, yeah, 90, 92, and then the act was in 93. And the educational progress it has been made since then will be at risk so long as our school systems are fiscally, fiscally strained by the ongoing failure to substantively reconsider the adequacy of the foundation budget. And, right. you know, I mean, it's been... Um, so, yeah, since the first time I ever got on a school committee, this has been a topic. <laughs> Um, as has transportation. transportation yeah. 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 So, all right. Are we ready for the vote? Yes. All those in favor? So, zero. I will provide Mrs. Engelson with the um, address that I had. We'll get it sent out to our legislators. Thank you so much for bringing this forward. So, any Okay, we need a motion. Um, so we'll move to enter into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining, non-represented personnel, and the approval of minutes, and not to return to open session. And is a roll call vote? Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Oh. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can we get a second on that before we ask you? Quick, two quick questions of the board on the new liaison and yeah, we should have introduced sure. Andy. Yes, uh, I, 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 I wanted to wait to the end. Everybody knows what it is. I'll be, I'll be very quick. Um, so um, I have to report back to our board, um, give a brief uh, liaison report, um, and. Um, so I just I, I had a couple of questions for two questions for you um, in how best to do that. First, the, a lot was covered tonight. I'll have to shrink it down and do a quick blurb. But um, I, I can't promise that I understood everything that went on here tonight. <laughs> Would it be uh, appropriate if I contacted the superintendent or you or somebody yeah. for to check the the validity of everything that I said? Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the second thing is that I'm, you know, I like you, I can't make all my, my liaison meetings. So um, at, at some point, if we could figure a way, I'd still like to give a report to the the select board about what's what you all are doing. Well, you'll you'll get a important packet from uh, Mrs. Engels. Right, nope. but but if I can't can't make the meeting, it, it would be great to figure out a way where where I could come up with a synopsis of what happened at the meeting and provide it to the board. So I, I don't know if we can work together we'll on that or not, but, but maybe we can do something. And with the legal alert, this may be something that, this affects the select board too. Well, that, that came to us sure. from Bob. Yeah, yeah, right. Bob, yeah, Bob originally brought it to my attention. He says, I think this is gonna impact you too. Oh, that, that <laughs> specific alert is from the MASC, but right. it was originally yes. brought. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, so maybe we can work together and save resources. Thank you very much. Thanks. You have to roll. We did. We did. Oh, we did roll. Call it passed. So, it passed. So we're probably just in here. Okay. Thank you.